Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Big Boys Table. It's episode 41. We are just one away from the epic number, the first of many to come. And uh, joining me as always is Mess. We're going to just continue our conversation from a week and a half ago when we did the previous one. How are you? Smoke weed. How am I? Yeah. <laughs> How are you? Dude, I'm fucking exhausted. <laughs> the last yeah. week has been uh, a living hell. <laughs> Well, if you feel like uh, getting into it for the purpose of contextualizing it, it might actually help to, uh, ta- you know, lead us into our next phase of our it, discussion because it, you know, it's like psych- ties it and can cycles. Set the stage. Yeah, back I think in. people go through this kind of stuff sometimes. Yeah, so. like because uh, I think you want to continue the whole motivation slash slash right. discipline thing. Exactly. And, uh, this, this is definitely one of those things that really tests your motivation and your discipline. So, all right, so where do I, so obviously I'm pretty sure I detailed uh, way back at the beginning of October, uh, we have two cats, uh, the older one, the little white one, Snowball, uh, she had a near fatal incident from her blood pressure, uh, nearly causing her retinas to detach from her eyes, and that was because of uh, kidney failure. So she has stage three kidney failure. Now, stage three is out of four, so... Uh, to discover it at stage three is really bad, but, you know, when you're obviously very poor, you can't just do blood tests often like you really want to. So um, it, it did kind of sneak up on us. So um, that was a disaster. That was just one of, like, there's so much to go through that I couldn't even recount the kind of insanity that has happened since then. Because there was a uh, the car radiator needing to be replaced. Like, basically, I live on existence minimum. So just kind of barely scraping by, also trying to pay off debts. And it's really penny-pinching every single day. Every single day is penny-pinching. And, of course, ever since, like, the end of 2013, when the cat first started having problems with her eyes in the middle of 2014, when we got evicted and rent increased by over double uh, in the new place, and there's been, like, a lot of other stuff going on, it's been, like, a nonstop struggle to really be productive, to really get into the mindset of really doing too much of anything. And, um, you know, that's when, like, all the sleeping issues started up, and, the, you know, a lot of the health issues started up, like, my chair broke, and uh, we don't have a vehicle that can get another chair, so or can't afford another chair, so I've been stuck in, like, a really shitty wooden chair. It's been slowly destroying my back. So, you know, everything kind of, like, compounds itself. But within, like, the last week, you know, things are already really bad, you know, with the cats and the debt and everything else. Just It's just been like this nonstop, like every day is worse over and over and over and over again. And now um, uh, we have, uh, uh, I think it, it was close. To, yeah, it's about a week ago now, about a week ago. So I think it was actually very soon after we uh, finished the last podcast that um, the second cat decided out of the blue to stop eating. And um, so the second cat's about 10 years old. So he's like, he's, he's senior, but not like really like in the danger zone, really, for like some of the more major issues that are going to crop up, like, you know, kidneys and stuff like that. But he, you know, this stuff can happen. And um, what happens is uh, he just decides to stop eating out of the blue. So this is a cat that basically would eat like half a tin or more of food in the morning every single day. And he really likes his food. And he would always, like, bother people in the morning at, like, 4 a.m. to get up and feed him. So for him to just suddenly out of the blue decide, I don't want to eat anymore, is bad news. So normally when a cat decides to stop eating, it's uh, it's actually kind of a medical emergency. Because um, cats need protein for calories, to process calories. And what will happen with a cat when they don't eat for several days is they will actually... Uh, be at really like just a couple days, they become a major severe risk of liver disease. Uh, because I'm not exactly sure of the reasons why, but it, it is something you, you they need to be eating. And he is also not drinking, so that's even more immediately dangerous because you know, just like people, you know, people can go for a while without eating, but like two days or something without water is pretty bad news for a cat. It's basically the same thing. So, um, for a cat to suddenly stop eating and drinking out of the blue, it could be any number of things. Ah, but I probably mentioned this at the last coffee hour. We had a freak ice storm that was coming. So, it just so happens 
that this all starts up at the exact time that this ice storm hits. And uh, we didn't get anywhere near the temperatures that we were supposed to get, like negative 20 something. We got like negative 10, which was still like a record breaking cold for this place. But um, what ends well, up happening is... Well, you must have been is, comfortable uh, then. Yeah, yeah. I didn't mind the cold at all, but now my ride had no way of going to the vet. Also, we had no money. So, uh, just a little bit of scraping is from here and there. So, um, yeah, I had to do one of the most uncomfortable things I have ever actually done in my entire life. Uh, I had to go out on my own and use a taxi to get there and a taxi to get back and take the cat with me. And um, I'm not a social person, and I do not like public spaces, and I do not like being near strangers. I definitely do not like getting in cars with strangers, and I just don't conduct myself well around people whatsoever, even people I know for that matter. So for me to do this, it was, um, in a word, extremely stressful. I think it's probably the worst I had felt in a really long time. Like, it was bad enough I had to go out on my own uh, with the last little bit of money that we could scrape together from, like, three separate people. Four separate people. But it was also that um, I had a cat with me that uh, now had gone for two or three days without food. And uh, things were looking, like, worse and worse and worse by the day. And there was a very real chance that I wasn't actually going to be able to accomplish anything about it. So that that was also bad. Um, it, you know, the funny thing about this is that every single time I tried to do something productive, like I try to work on videos, I try to work on D&D, I try to work on projects, something like this happens. I actually had decided in light to the last copy hour I was going to make another swing at trying to finish the WoW series. I literally had got that set up the day before all of this started. And then, pow, right off the bat, all this shit starts. It is it is systematic. It is systematic. Every single time I try to do something, shit explodes in my face all over. I just get covered in semen and scats and moldy pizza that's been overcooked. And, you know, a couple dozen rounds of that, it gets pretty demoralizing, actually. It, it, it gets to be pretty demoralizing. So the short of the story is that basically I went there for nothing. Uh, there was there was nothing we could figure out. The examination didn't reveal anything. Uh, there was nothing in his mouth. We needed to take him uh, to have blood tests done. So that was an order of magnitude more amount of money than what I like. It costed me over thirty dollars just to get there, just just for the rides back and forth was thirty something dollars. That's expensive. That's really, 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 really expensive. And the vet visit was basically the last of the money we had. So um, now, basically, I was told that, uh, yeah, we don't understand anything that's going on. We it, this, this is a problem that can come from anything from, oh, the cat, like, has seasonal sickness to the cat has cancer and is going to die. So, like, it, you basically got, like, the WebMD of diagnosis. So you really needed to have a blood test and other stuff. And uh, that wasn't going to happen at this point. So I took him back home. And um, uh, I did uh, take with me some anti-nausea. And some... Uh, it was like an appetizer. Like an appetizer stimulant. So the appetizer stimulant goes in the air, absorbed through the skin. All is good. The anti-nausea is a pill that goes in the mouth. Now, I've been giving Snowball pills every single day, along with two other drugs every single day, multiple times a day, since October. And that's nothing new. I've had to go through a few months of this before, but now it's lifelong. So now I had another cat that I also have to manage on top of it. So this is why I haven't been here, really, for any more than like a one-liner from my tablet in the last week because I actually haven't had time to sit down. I haven't had time to sleep. I haven't had time to even find a pot to piss in, as David Manning would put it. Because I had basically a cat that was going to die if I did not get food and water into it and try to pull it out of this mess it was in. 
because he now had already gone for several days without food. And I didn't know if he was drinking or not. I thought he had drank at one point, but I didn't know. Like, he obviously wasn't drinking enough because, like, 80% of their water is going to come from wet food. And if he's not eating, he's not getting water. And if he's not getting water, if he does actually have a kidney problem, it will kill him. So, uh, not to speak of the fact he's not drinking water anyways. So, actually, what I have done for the last about four or five days, up until yesterday, actually, is I have used a syringe every half hour to hour to hour and a half, depending on how much I give him, to uh, force feed him water and food. And... It was um, difficult. So the cat was lethargic, but still had more than enough energy to fight me every step, every single step of the way. So I would get completely covered in cat slobber and food and water. And pro I would actually, I timed it. So a good feeding session where I actually didn't get fought a lot, it would take me about an hour to give him everything that I needed for that time. And it still actually wasn't enough because a cat around his weight is supposed to be eating about two tins of cat food a day. But to get it into a liquid enough form where you could use it in a syringe, you have to mix it with water and blend in. And that creates more fluids. And just one syringe is really hard to get in his mouth to begin with. So, um, yeah. So it's, it's just like for me at that point, you become like sort of like desensitized to everything. You stop really like thinking. You stop really like worrying about stuff. You stop really like, you know, thinking about, you know, tomorrow or, or yesterday or an hour from now. It's just what you have in front of you. You become very systematic and mechanical about it. I've, about, I've had about two or three hours of sleep to my name every single day for the past um, three or four months now. And, um, like, I'm just accustomed to being tired and exhausted all the time at this stage. And it, you know, getting up early is horrible and all this. Like, I, like this is this is one of the many reasons why I just can't do your kind of schedule. Like, I can't get up and do things like this. It's really, really, really hard for me to do it. But there are things I had to keep on a schedule. And now there was, you know, this hourly thing that was going on again. And I've already done this several times. But, you know, the years go by. You don't feel younger. You feel older. It gets harder and harder and harder to, to do this. Like, it gets physically harder to do this to the point where your brain just really can't function under these conditions anymore. So at the end of the day, you know, you, you, you take kind of step back and you think about, so what about all this stuff I was working on? What about all, the, all these projects I wanted to get done? What about all these things I wanted to do? So, you know, on the short term, I've got the D&D &D work. And I have uh, recordings from another D&D &D game that Schwa ran that I wanted to process. And then now I have the WoW series I wanted to be able to record again, you know. And I had all this stuff set up and ready to go before all this happened again. So I'm ready just to throw it all out again and be just like, fuck it. But I can't do that for D&D &D in particular because I have an obligation to run it every week. So you just have to kind of like like try to manage your time. So during the D&D &D game, I I had a decision I could cancel the D&D &D game and uh, not run it for a week or two. But I decided I would run it and I would just have to take breaks. I just have to really manage my time. Normally, I don't really manage your time except for, you know, the actual length of the game. I try to keep it at about five hours maximum. But now I, I had a cat to force feed every hour to two hours and then another cat to, to feed as well because they can't eat each other's food. So... You can't just like leave food out for them or whatever and just let them deal with it. They can't do that. You need you need to interact every single time. So um you know, it really sets the stage for not simple like I already struggle with motivation. As we talked about last time. I already struggle a lot with with just, you know, setting my foot down and actually moving forward. And I have got all this other stuff going on that's really, really, really draining you. Really, really, really draining you. So I was lucky in that I had prepared enough ahead of time with my D&D &D work that I didn't need those four or five days for the session that I ran. But now I'm at the stage right now where it's like, okay. So we're having this podcast. It's Tuesday. I could have a game on Friday. I am not prepared. I'm not ready for that. But thank God the cat started eating yesterday. I find like it took three attempts, three because three, to get the anti nausea in him, 
that he would actually like like keep it like I basically first I tried to pill him that doesn't work um too resistant and then I tried to put it in food with a syringe that did not work too resistant uh so I smashed it up into water in a syringe and gave it to him that worked I got a lot of spittle and and vomit all over me because uh it's it's like a bitter, really, it dissolves really fast. It's really bitter tasting. So when you give it to them, they kind of like foam at the mouth. Like they've got rabies <laughs> and there's a lot of drooling involved. I've been covered in cat slobber more times than I can count in the last couple of days. And then um, uh, yesterday, uh, we actually managed to take him to the vet and uh, get his blood test done. And they actually just straight up just gave him an injection. Uh, but today they gave me more pills. So we actually haven't been able to pay for that yet. We are on a like a post data check kind of deal right now. Um, another hard month awaits of very very little food. This is the first time I've had cream for my coffee in a month because we just haven't been able to afford it. And now the next month is going to be really hard because you know the the stuff we just paid now. And actually, the test for the blood for the cat came back today, and there is nothing on it he's a little low on protein and that's it so now we we that's good like it's good it tells us that you know he doesn't have like a lim- lingering kidney problem that's building up he doesn't you know as far as we can tell have cancer thank god you know stuff like that but at the same time we don't know why this happens we we don't know what's going on at all so i kind of have to just keep on going until we can scrape together the funds to do like an x-ray or an ultrasound, something like that, and I hope that finds it, right? And that could lead to something like, oh, he somehow swallowed something and it's stuck in his system and now he needs fucking surgery or some shit, right? So uh, we're just kind of just hoping that it's something temporary and then he gets over it because, yeah. But uh, no, it's a real trial. Amidst all this, I have to work. I have D&D stuff to do. I can't... You know, if I let this take control, if I let the anxiety take control and I stop working completely, there's a good chance I am never going to come back to it. Like so many other things, I don't want to stop working because it's really the only thing I've got going. You know, you got to try to keep some kind of consistency and keep moving forward and stuff like this, I think. Well, that was an observation that we ended up making in the uh, previous podcast that it's a lot easier to stay working if you actually stay working. Like as soon as you stop, you lose momentum. Life is a a momentum based game, I think is a quote from that one. But for Mm -hmm. sure, it was something that I think uh, just feels intuitive once you hear the thought uh, expressed that way. It it ends up being something that most people agree with. Now, some people are going to be uh, probably confused as to the degree of like the the lengths that you are going to just to ensure the the health of your relatively old cats are mm-hmm. like is secure and maybe you could just touch on that briefly or however long you actually want to touch on it but uh, i know like for just from knowing you that pets in general but especially your cats most recently have been uh, very important for you just as something to try yeah. to to hold on to it. You have an emotional connection with them. And so uh, I suppose that that's probably the main motivating factor. But I also remember at some point I asked you what, what the plan was or if you had given much thought to what happens when eventually they do go and they do pass. So in that sort of situation, uh, when the cats eventually do die, or I guess like it's probably, it, they're probably not going to happen at the same time. So Obviously, things wouldn't as bad as the one going would be. You'd still have the other, but eventually, they're both are going to be gone. You had said to me, I think at the time that you really weren't giving that much thought, or if whatever thought you did have mm-hmm. was all negative and and sort of uh, despondent, like you didn't really think that it's there was a very much bad thought. Yeah, so maybe you can elaborate a bit more on your emotional connection with them. That can give us a bit more grounding to your sp- specific situation. Maybe we can end up using mm-hmm. that for the podcast so- as well. As much as you it's want to, It's kind of hard to explain it, but they're my family. Like, I don't have a family. I don't have a mother. I don't have a father. You know, I don't have a brother. I don't have a sister. I have my grandmother who is more, like, distantly related. You know, there isn't a real connection there. There isn't a real understanding there. And, you know, I have, like, the one person that I've met, which was, like, HKS in person, that I would consider a friend. So, like I said, I'm not a social person. I don't interact with people. I never will attempt the whole relationship thing. I think it's just a waste of time. 
and I don't connect with people. And people don't connect with me, and that's been demonstrated countless times in the many, many myriad of times I've ever attempted to interact with groups of people. It just doesn't work out. Because I expect a lot of things that people can't deliver, like, you know, you know, honesty and stuff like that. It, it, there's a lot of things that just never get reciprocated in the vast majority of groups or individuals that I've interacted with over the years. Right. So, but animals are, are you know, unconditional in a way. Now, I've heard, you know, many discussions about the philosophy of how, you know, an animal's connection to you really isn't, you know, this or that. But um, when you live with something and care for something for over 10 years, you do develop a very close bond with them. You think of them as family. You know, they're something that you understand more and more and more. Like, I've spent my entire life around animals, and I had a dog who was blind. And she died in 2006, along with a whole bunch of other animals. All of, all of our dogs died in 2006. And um, one of the dogs that died was, uh, it wasn't her dog. Like, the first one that died wasn't our dog. It was uh, the mother of the dogs. And that dog almost took out my right eye when I was young. Uh, she almost blinded me. Because um, they were not very friendly dogs. And... Um, this dog ended up just coming into my care because uh, she was attacked. They were, uh, they, my grandmother and her husband used to walk their dogs. And um, there was a man who had a German shepherd. And it was supposed to be muzzled by law. And uh, he didn't muzzle it. And it attacked this dog and skinned her alive. And uh, that's uh, one of the things where this debt comes, comes from, by the way. They're still trying to pay off the remnants of a debt from 2006. So that, that gives you uh, an idea of what how disastrous this financial situation has always been. And um, uh, even though he was required by law to muzzle his dog, uh, we couldn't do anything to him at all. We couldn't touch him. And they paid over $10,000 in medical expenses on this dog. And um, uh, her husband couldn't look, at, look after it because she required like intensive care. Uh, around the clock care uh, to recover from this this horrible attack because like her whole back her whole back was skinned basically so um that ended up coming down to me I ended up looking after this dog so this is a dog that I really didn't know and um even thinking about it now is hard honestly yeah, you it's, don't have uh, to go too far into it if you're not. Obviously, I know it's a touchy subject. So she was uh, very close to recovering. Actually, two weeks I look after her, and then she died. Cancer got her. Uh, the attack weakened her enough that cancer took over and then finished her off. So that was hard. That was my first experience with uh, animal death of that nature. Um, they used to be breeders. Uh, they had puppies that would sometimes not make it, and that was I was too young at the time to really like feel the full impacts of that to really understand that. But this this was hard. This was very hard. And uh, there was another dog, um, the father of the dogs actually, that I also ended up looking after. He uh, uh, he was another dog that actually had attacked me too. Both those dogs were not friendly. Um, there was a time uh, way back before then. Where basically he had attacked, like if you, if you looked at my face, there's about four or five separate large scars all across my face. Uh, some around my eye, some on the cheek, and they're all from the dog attacking and going through my face. And uh, I ended up looking after that dog as well. So it's weird how things turned out, but um, I, he died after the fact. Uh, but you still, I still ended up developing an attachment to these dogs, even though I didn't even know them. So I don't know. That's just the kind of person I was, I guess. And uh, yeah, it's hard to pinpoint a reason per se, but just knowing that that's mm -hmm. more or less uh, personality trait of yours kind of helps us mm -hmm. set the stage for this sort of situation. Because obviously, anytime I th at least uh, I would go as far as to assume anytime any sort of health concern gets brought up around the cats, I'm sure in large part due to your past experience with the dogs uh, and just in general with your experience with animals, uh, the worst goes through your mind I'm, I'm imagining yeah so that, that's always like a driving force in uh you know immediate stress response which can, which can be helpful in a crisis but in a, especially in a situation such as 
you know, your, your the most recent one that you went through where you weren't really sure what was going on. Sometimes it leads to an overreaction or an overcorrection in such a fashion where the uh, results, while comforting from a, a standpoint of, you know, you know, the facts, you know, that there's no real immediate cause for concern, but now you have to, like, there's some sacrifice you made. You have to, you know, obviously there's a social situation that you had to go through. And then there's a financial situation that you had to, you know, continue to mm-hmm. dig into. And so, yeah. um, I never recovered from that. Like, uh, my dog passed soon after actually. Uh, I still remember the day, May 23rd, 2006. Uh, it was the same day we were handed our eviction notice for that house as well. So, um, we, I had lived there for most of my life, so I don't take well to environmental changes. So I lost my dog and my home on the same day. Yeah. And, uh, that was absolutely horrendous that, that to, to this day, I still have nightmares about that. It, it affected me on a level that is not possible for me to describe. So, uh, then we had, uh, they had a lot of dogs, uh, three more died after that. And that was all of them were hard. So I basically watched everything that I had known and lived by just disappear all around me piece by piece and die piece by piece by piece. And it was absolutely wretched. So today, when I think about such things, I cannot see a way of even surviving it, honestly, especially mentally. It's just, it's unthinkable. And anytime it comes up, I'm just like, no, I don't want to deal with it. I don't even think about it. Because when I think about it, I get really depressed really fast. Right, of course. Because, you know, like I didn't want to have more animals after that. I really didn't. But they kind of just ended up here. Like the one, the first one, Snowball, was a stray. And my grandmother started feeding her, and um, she just ended up in our care, incidentally. So then we got another one uh, so that she'd have company. And now we have two cats that uh, have been, they're very high maintenance, very, very high maintenance. And, uh, you know, Snowball has been through so much. This all, a lot of this stuff started in uh, 2013. So... You know, if it's even some random cat, it would still bother me to have to see them go. But she has been fighting uh, everything, just just all odds for so long, so long, seven years. It can, it's hard to even believe this has gone on for seven years uh, when her uh, chronic eye ulcer started up. And throughout all this time, I've been trying to be productive, trying to work on projects, trying to work on videos. I started doing uh, public video casting uh, for a general audience back in like early 2010 with StarCraft 2. But in 2013, I was mostly focused on LPs and stuff like that. And in the background of, yeah, in Retribution as well, uh, which we've talked about, uh, in the background of all that is this this catastrophe with this this cat and then the housing and then the finances and then everything related. And it is like just it's miserable. It is absolutely miserable. And you know, I, I talk to a lot of people who claim they have depression or claim they know what depression is like or whatever. And, you know, they're living they're living with their parents. And their parents have tons of money. And, you know, they get to spend money on gacha games. You know, there's uh, people who complain about their parents and their parents give them, you know, like $900 gifts. And, you know, don't bat an eye that, you know, they do absolutely nothing and they just give them just, you know, hundreds to thousands of dollars just, just, just for nothing. And then they claim they know about depression when they have never tasted real loss within the last year there's two people that i know that have died and you know i didn't know them very well but i knew them well enough that it still affected me and you know i'm surrounded by just everything just really just struggling to move anywhere so when it comes to the whole discipline thing, when it comes to the whole motivation thing, I've talked to people about this stuff for years because I've always tried to encourage people to, you know, I don't like doing people's work for them. Like I've always been more about helping people learn stuff and be more dependent on their own, mostly because I'm lazy, right? I don't like, there's a lot of people, like there was the Sons of War project for StarCraft One, 
and they wanted me to do their mod work for them. And, you know, they handed me this list of this extremely unrealistic expectations, uh, like custom abilities and stuff like that. Unheard of shit. Maybe you could do it today with ASMM, but you would have a lot of work cut out for you today. Back then, it was just unthinkable. And I said, no, this stuff's impossible. And then, you know, some people wanted to get graphics in. And then it was like the guy who was making the graphics, Sergeant HK. And, you know, I would rather teach him how to render the graphics in 3ds max himself this is what eventually led to me doing stuff like making these stuff and releasing uh those assets on game proc is because of the amount of times that uh people have asked me about this kind of stuff because i don't want to do people's work for them i'd rather them just do it on their own because it's less but it's also more that i would prefer to see people for one hold themselves to higher standards and do stuff and you know for two be more self-sufficient because this was back when too many people would try to make projects with teams. And it's it's really just unnecessary. You don't need a team to make the vast majority of games out there, much less mods. And all you need is really just dedication and the ability to learn. So, of course, in the backdrop of all this, I have struggled enormously with motivation myself. Not just because of autism and stuff like that, because that also really affects my ability to focus and learn, but also because of just this shit going on in real life incessantly. Just just endless, endless, and like that. I haven't even touched the iceberg of the insanity that's happened in the last, you know, so and so years. It's just 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 the cats alone. It's just monumentally depressing every step of the way and it's a massive trial of manpower and energy to do this i'd say the only thing i've actually really been able to focus on and get done is keep the cats alive you know which thankfully i've been able to do but it's really come at the cost of of basically everything else but still at the end of the day you know i like to try to think that yes you know sometime i will get some work done and you know i still get to do D D work i still try to get video stuff done i've still sat down and say yes i want to try to get the wow series done i still would like to finish you know editing sonic 2006 and all this other work i would still like to you know get back into unreal 4 when we can figure out this you know fucking character animation bullshit that we've run into and i mean when all this started with snowball way back in october that was actually the most productive month of years ever since mid 2017 when i got gaslit by a bunch of people and got really depressed as a result is that I decided I was going to work on Unreal 4, and I actually got quite a bit done within the scope of a month. I had an AI that can navigate Z. I had melee combat with damage for both players and AI. You know, I had opponents that can teleport and chase you and stuff like that. I had, you know, combo movesets, damage collision, and, you know, I had redone all those animations and stuff like that for uh, the WoW models and things like that. So there was a lot I had done in a very short amount of time that I really didn't think I could do in a short amount of time. And um, I'm not really sure how that works. I think it's, again, you know, I mentioned this before, it's more like a stubbornness than really motivation on my behalf, which is probably why it didn't really last very long when I ran into really hard stuff. Because basically at this point, if I want to really make the, the stuff I want to do, I'm going to have to learn how to use blender and that was not what, really what i signed up for because blender is honestly one of the worst programs i have ever used it's right up there with starcraft 2's editor it's it's terrible it's bad the the interface is just atrocious absolutely atrocious <sighs> but that's what i signed on for by doing this right but then you know you just find excuses not to do it and i think that you know looking back at the last week and then looking back at the last um, podcast that we had where you were talking about your scheduling and stuff like that. I think it's sort of understand a little bit of how it works for you in that when you have multiple time sensitive things, you become somewhat actually less conscious about the passage of time and more about the actual management of that time. And I think that's a really important, it's a really a minor, but a very important distinction well, I'm not sure how much I can speak to that. Uh, the thing for me is that, well, we, we I definitely want to, to come back to the whole emotional side of things eventually, because obviously that plays a big part. Uh, but I suppose we can put a pin in that for now, and then we can open it back up in a, maybe after we're done with this particular diversion. But uh, one of the things that I think is most useful for managing your time in general is... A f like it, I ha struggled to con come up with a good way to describe it without sounding uh, 
like melodramatic, but it's like a constant feeling of inadequacy. Uh, while, but it, it's not like that negative. It's more like a constant sense that you didn't live up to your actual potential yet. And if you feel that in a daily basis without allowing it to reduce your a bit, like your ability to feel good about yourself and your, like your, your actual potential, if you use it as like, I want to achieve something, if you use it more as like an indicator for the days where you really exceeded your ex- your own expectations, you can, you know, use that as a barometer. Like, do, did I feel like I got as much done as I really could have today? Generally, the answer will be no. But some days the answer will be almost or just better than what it normally is, even if it's not a- actually the up- utmost ideal where you made every single minute count or whatever, uh, which is obviously generally unrealistic. But still some, finding some mental space that you can get into where you can use that as a goal as like an ideal to strive towards it works because it's it's sort of like what we were talking about in the previous podcast where i mentioned finding some way to constantly look for a uh, something that to consistently challenge yourself at and so like the the more mundane version of that is just can i do x again and so, you know, the answer to that is no until you release something or until you finish something. And, you know, just that challenge alone can be enough to at least springboard your your creativity or your motivation. And then, you know, you can get back into the rhythm of trying to, to do something. So, like, right now, one of my motivational strategies or one of the things that keeps me motivated any, in general is the notion that, you know, I'm, I'm meeting that challenge of can I do it again with my brother's birthday project? And that's what I'm working on right now is Toddborn, this anime police donut <laughs> extravaganza. And so, you know, can I do it again? Can I release a set of maps again uh, for his birthday? And like just being able to release one map in and of itself is an answer to that challenge. And then further, you know, you build on that. You can, can I make it two maps or three maps or can I add X feature or Y feature, or can I do X, uh, bit in the script or, you know, whatever the case may be, like you can break that down. It's like a, a, a fractal sort of solution where it just gets deeper, the more you engage in it. And it un- uh, unlocks, like, as long as you're willing to consider whatever you have done as worthy as worthwhile, uh, th- as a, an actual challenge that should be documented, that's worthy of being documented at all, then there's so many different things that you can take away from any given experience, any given finished product, and probably even any given unfinished product that you worked on for a w- time before shelving or postponing or just completely abandoning. Is there, There's something you can take away from it in a positive sense that allows you to feel a bit more, uh, well, a bit less at odds with yourself about... In, in, a, in a way that kneecaps your motivation. I don't think that challenging oneself in a mental sense or being, you know, not no longer being satisfied with what you've been able to do. I don't think that's a bad thing because I think it comes from a good place. It comes from a, a place of, you know, what you're capable of or you you have an expectation that you want to get to for what you can do. Um, and, and you know that if you managed your time well, you could do that. Uh, and you didn't do that here and you want to do it now or you want to do it next time and you you wanted to do it this time but it didn't go through like being able to to take a, that away from a failed attempt at answering to a challenge or even an attempt that you're working on right now like keeping that in the back of your head as you're working that can make or break your motivational uh, your ability to do the things that you wouldn't want to do in general like you said you didn't enjoy most of the work that you were doing And obviously that makes it harder, but it doesn't make it impossible. Uh, If you're really only interested in finishing something and releasing the World of Warcraft series or releasing, uh, say, like uh, the D and like some some D and D videos uh, that you were talking about, the castovers from Schwa or anything like any compilation, any video series, any campaign in my case, uh, just being able to to use that as your main motivating factor, like making that what you you've you've told us in the previous podcast that what you were most interested in is that it's like, if you can release something, that's how you can uh, divine meaning from it and it, or derive meaning from it. And so if you can derive meaning from that, then you can use that as a motivating uh, piece in your arsenal. And that can be something that can motivate you. And you, you just have to get into the right headspace where you consider that uh, above all else. Like it is really important that you release something. And so you're not going to, 
you know, worry about it being, uh, you're not necessarily going to worry about times. You're going to mostly focus on like what you need to improve with your process, with your uh, mental state, your physical state, whatever you need to improve to get to the point where you can finish the project that you're working on or finish a project in general, you can turn your process itself into that sort of project where you tweak whatever is not working, whatever you feel is not working and uh, until it works for you. And I think that that was one of the realizations when I, I remember I was taking a walk to the gas station to take a shit not so long ago. And I was listening to some video where some guy was talking about how, uh, they had, they felt good about what they were able to accomplish that year because one of the things that they were able to do was, uh, they, they, they didn't sacrifice quality, but they improved their ability. Like they mostly focused on improving their ability to produce at volume, uh, some product or another. And it was a creative task. So it was still mapped on, like it still made sense when you compared the two of like their work and mine. But that made me think and consider the idea that if you're, you know, we've talked about process over product, I think, on one of the other big boys tables. I'm sure it's come up in conversation anyway, but we've we've already considered this on the podcast, but it bears repeating here that you do use your process more than you use, than, than you work on any given project. Like your process is what you use across all projects. And so if you work on that well, it is obvious in, in fresh in your mind where its deficiencies are, and you try to make it so that those deficiencies can be shored up, and you can practice and refine your strengths, and you can stay on top of that. To some extent, that's what you're doing every time you work on anything, but if you can really focus on it and consider it after your work is sat down for the day and sort of replay it in your head and consider it for more... Uh, for, for more time than you have been before. That can be another way where you can see meaningful gains in a short amount of time that will hopefully help to motivate you in the same way that, you know, getting your Warcraft 3 cutscene just in a basic form that you could record it in, that's meaningful gains. That's a meaningful result of your work. You can record that. You can show it to other people. You can just look back at it yourself and see where it, what needs to be changed without having to go open up the map and go to a specific point. Like there's a lot of utility to that. It's in the same sort of way you can compare how quickly you're able to do something or how efficiently you're able to do something uh, based on, uh, you know, comparing how much harder it was or how much longer it took, you know, maybe a month ago or a year ago. That's where you can see more immediate gains than immediately releasing something. And that might also help bridge the gap. And I think that when I realized that your process was the project that you never stop working on in, in a way, that helped me to become less uneasy about how long it was taking to actually finish something and release something, which is always in the back of your head, no matter how sort of Zen you are about making projects. Anyway, you're always thinking, you know, it's been a while since my last one, I got to try and get this out at some point. And that's always a struggle. Uh, even if, it, you know, you know, in your heart of hearts, it shouldn't be. But despite that, that, that still doesn't really like, it doesn't quite encapsulate everything that I would think about that or everything that I would say about that concept, because you, you mentioned time sensitive things and those do at some point make you make compromises more than you would be making anyway. Like everybody makes compromises on what their yeah. ideal vision is compared to what the end result is. But time sensitive things make you, if you're doing it properly and managing your time properly, you're doing the bare minimum first and the basics and fundamentals, and then you're putting polish where you can, and you're prizing like testing and raw functionality over anything else, which is not always conducive to what your normal process is. And so it's sort of like flexing a muscle you don't usually use in that sense, where you're, you're going through and using a process, part of your process, or, or sort of conforming your process to a different kind of design uh, element or outline. And, and by changing your process entirely in some ways, you are obviously changing the outcome itself. And uh, I mean, I, I think it's kind of a no brainer when you explain it that way, when you hear it explained that way. But I also think that it sure, it, it's like a way to say, Hey, I've got this time sensitive thing. It has to happen at this time. Like that's a way to kind of crystallize all of the work that you could be like you could have to do all this work and maybe normally under normal circumstances where there is no time constraint you would take it a very different way but it's a way to like 
kind of cut the bullshit out and trim the fat out and only work on what absolutely needs to be worked on when it needs to be worked on so that it can be done by a certain deadline. And like the best case scenario you can hope for in that situation is that you finish the fundamentals and you have a functional end product to show, be it a video series or a campaign or whatever, uh, by the deadline and then add polish and then add like, you know, sand off the rough edges and, you know, anything else. And, and if your design process is really well suited to this thing, maybe there's not that much work left to do as far as the polish is concerned. Maybe it's just production of certain art assets or going back and trimming out some of the edits in a compilation or something and, and really like, you know, get just getting it down to exactly what it needs to be. Uh, obviously, it I varies from medium to medium. I uh, did in a time-sensitive manner and explain it a little bit if you want. Sure. Let's uh, take a look. Okay. Let me give me one second here. So... Um, gen- like like I said before, like when I approach something, I'm looking at it from like a top down perspective, and then when it becomes like really time sensitive, like the D and D stuff, I tend to like internally in my head prioritize what's the most important thing. So, um, who was, I think it was Belithal was working on uh, uh, porting a Master Chief graphic to StarCraft or something. Like that. Yeah, and um, I was saying that uh, what you want to do is get it in-game as fast as possible. Like, once you got your basic animation, you want to see it in-game as fast as possible to expedite the process of determining how to improve it. Because um, you can spend a long time trying to uh, perfect the graphic just by looking at a GIF preview, but then when you look at it in-game, it's it could look very weird alongside the other units. So uh, getting it in-game as fast as possible is one of those things that can really help you determine where to improve it to really like maximize your time so um i am going to show you some maps i worked on in D, and i showed these before but i'm going to show them again nothing is better than holding down your push to talk key in notepad plus plus and seeing a billion threes appear on screen <laughs> Okay, so it's probably in the other folder. Okay, so um, during Albion 3, there was a period in which I think I made about a dozen maps in less than a week. I vaguely remember a huge uh, picture dump at some point in Artism, and that's probably around the same time. So um, let me take a look here. So you're going to want to cycle these side by side or on top of each other so you can actually see their changes because some of them are going to be really minor. Uh, what would be a good example? Pro- oh, okay. Let's go with this. So um, let me just think for a second. One of these will work, right? Or will it be one of those? Uh, no, let's go with this. Okay. Let's talk about Samissia's throne. Okay. <laughs> So this was one of the final arenas. So this is where I started off with. So we were looking at something that I was going to have to run within a day or two. So I really didn't want to take a long time to make it. So I started off with basically blocking out my initial concept. So uh, what I do is I take another map, I strip out all the stuff of it, and I throw in a thing. So I had in my head what I wanted to have happen. And the center north, we're going to have a throne. That's where the boss is going to be. This, uh, the center of the map was going to be a disc. And what was going to happen is partway through the fight, the boss was going to destroy all the outlawing platforms. You were just going to have the disc. And that's going to be our primary arena for the vast majority of the fight. Uh, there was going to be four stages to the first phase of the fight. In the first stage, you have uh, the boss in the north that will then disappear and spawn a bunch of eyes. Units that stand between the boss and the eyes, or just the eyes, uh, will end up taking some kind of effect. There's going to be cannons, these turrets, that move on rails. So on the right side, you're going to see my initial uh, blocking out of the rail structure uh, using meshes from Bless. So I initially, when I first set out, I had those goals. And okay, so I need the central disc. I need the platform for the throne. And then I need the rails. We have, I figure out in my head, the core things I need. So I, so I go for blocking out the initial shape, which is the surrounding platform and then the disc. And then the rails, and then what will eventually hold the throne. So once I've got that out, then I move on to the next phase. So the next phase is when I actually build the major defining objects of the map 
and make them look like they actually belong there. So now we have the rails and the surrounding structures. I added some objects onto the center of the platform. I adjusted the lighting, and then I fine-tuned the throne area a little bit. So at this stage, what you're probably thinking is there's going to be some problems with this because the elevation for the central platform is not actually that obvious. So one of the main issues I deal with and the big thing that really consumes a lot of time is this is actually an orthographic render. So it's the same thing that you'd be using in StarCraft. If you're rendering something for StarCraft, you're using orthographic. And what orthographic means is there's no depth. You ignore depth from the camera. So that's what you want for D&D &D because it is top down. Now, there is some cases that use isometric maps, but I can't get a good isometric map render uh, out of this. So we use orthographic top down. And um, what this means is that uh, all these meshes I'm using, they're in a 3D space. I'm modeling it in a 3D space. What happens is in my head, I know precisely what the depth for everything looks like because my eyes have already been trained to looking at the perspective. When I look at the orthographic render, I see everything for what it is because I've already trained my eyes by making it. Players don't have that information. They, they, don't have, they don't know anything about what this looks like. Their first experience is the orthographic projection. And by this point, uh, I already knew that some maps were giving people issues with reads. They didn't understand what elevations were what, and some textures were a little bit confusing for them. Uh, certain patterns of colors and brightness created the optical illusion of depth. So I learned a lot about this, actually. This was a big learning experience for me. And I didn't have much time to learn how to do this stuff, and I really didn't have many people I could talk to on how to uh, really break this down. So there was a drunk, drunk Swedishman I was talking to quite extensively throughout this. And uh, he would point out things that he felt were off. And uh, that was pretty much it. But he, was, he didn't play D&D. He didn't understand real context. But I knew that the central platform was going to be a bit of a problem. So as we go on, what you're going to see in these next screenshots is I am experimenting with lighting. So I'm going to send them one after the other. So in the third image, um, I think it's just very minor lighting stuff that I did. And I removed some stuff on the throne to simplify it because it was too busy. Um, I started adding in more detailing. There's these pipes underneath the platform. They come up kind of dark. I added in uh, just little minor details. But then, then we reach the, uh, the fourth image there. So now at this stage, I'm actually trying to deal with the depth. So what I did is I added brazers to the bottom. You'll notice that I've also spaced out things from the rails on the side and made them more obviously a part of the background than a part of the foreground. One of the tricks I do for pillars like this is to angle them. So there is uh, such a thing as like exaggerated angles, exaggerated deformation for certain kind of things. This falls into that category where you take something that's normally straight up like a pillar, but you angle it to give the illusion of depth to it for an orthographic view, which is what we're doing here. I've also blocked out the lighting a lot more in this. There's more grounding in the depth of the scene. So the throne and the central platform have more depth, but you'll notice the central platform still looks really busy. It still looks like a mess. And this was going to be a problem because uh, one of the big issues I have with a central platform that's not going to be very obvious unless you look super closely is there's actually seams running across it. So uh, we are going to fast forward into this image and then I'll wait for that to send. And then uh, this image. And then after that, we will have this image. So these three, three images, three. What we're going to see if we go through these is um, a little bit of a problem, a little bit of a problem. Let me just drag these up on my screen so I can see the exact differences. This is why you're gonna wanna flip through these a little bit. So we look at that first image and then the second one. So if you flip between those, what you're going to see is the central platform actually changes. So what's happened is I'm using a slightly different mesh. I have created duplicate meshes to hide the lower. <laughs> I have created uh, a separate platform to hide the lower level and try to make it flat looking, like a lolly. 
And I've also used a bunch of things that are all hand pa- hand paste uh, placed pixel by pixel to hide seams and light maps that come out as black black things. Very distracting. But you'll notice uh, there are still a lot of seams in the lighting of this, and they look really ugly. So in the next image, I adjusted the lighting much more dramatically to try to flatten it out and added uh, the epic evil red backlight for that red nebula. And if you know where to look, you're going to see black lines racing all over that central platform. So um, by this point, uh, this is actually map uh, major revision 7. And that equates to, I think, uh, it's worth noting that I don't have a render for this, but initially I tried to actually make a 3D mesh for this scene. That ended really badly. So now we were looking at, I think, about seven, eight hours total of work on this map. I have the basic shape all laid out, but one one of the things you're going to notice between all these images is that the main thing I'm focusing on is that central platform now, because this is the play area. The play area needs to be perfect, because this is where the players are going to spend most of their time during this battle, is in this the central disc. So the readability has to be good. The lighting has to be good. We don't want those black lines. We don't want issues with depth. But now, as you're noticing through all these iterations, I have run through countless problems trying to get it to look consistent and good, much less to get the depth to behave. So, um, I needed new meshes for the central. Thankfully, Bless provided. And uh, a little while later, and I had made custom materials for this. And here is our next version. So, you'll notice this looks a lot better. Right off the bat, this looks a lot better. The central platform looks much more readable. It looks a little more consistent with everything that's going on. And I'll just skip ahead a little bit and show you the final version of that, which has the final version of the lighting and all the detailing and stuff like that. And then I'll show you one of the transitionary uh, pieces for later in the battle as well. So you'll notice that I held off on detailing a lot until I had that central platform figured out. Um, Because basically, the way I saw things is that if I cannot get the core idea to work, there is not really much point in fussing around with the, you know, the fluff. Um, Like, say, in the Unreal 4 project, a big core thing for me is getting the player character to look good and feel good to play. Because if the player character isn't, you know, up to snuff, nothing else is going to really matter because you already have something that's disjointed at the very heart of the player's connectivity to the game. And a lot of these maps are basically the same way. I don't really premeditate much. I walk in with an idea. And what I want to do is I want to try to block out that idea and make that idea as feasibly functional as possible. Or at the very least, determine, you know, if that idea is feasibly functional. So with this particular map, that was the rails. Like, can I make rails? Can they look good? Turns out they looked all right. They don't really look like rails, but the cannons are separate objects that move up and down. It was obvious that that's what they were. I described them as such. We had the throne. That looked not great. Acceptable. And we had the central platform, and that's where we had a lot of issues. So I tried to model it. Didn't work out. Tried to use Terra meshes. Ran into issues with light maps. Ended up using those that says three separate bless, bless meshes uh, for a large object. I just lucked out. That was there. I, I uh, They had a different texture. I made custom texture material for them. And then that turned out very well. And then after that, it was just a matter of uh, adding the rest of the fluff afterwards. So by the time I had validated that this idea was possible, the rest came down to improving the lighting for the map, uh, moving around the other objects, you know, adjusting minor details there. This map still isn't perfect. There's still some dark spots in it. But the later phases were pretty good. And now I actually have to go AFK. So I will be back in about 10 or so minutes. Okay, and we are back. Hi. Smoke weed. So? So I don't know if you had anything to add to anything that I had said before. Yeah, you were discussing working under pressure. I guess, uh, what what exactly was the, the time pressure in that particular case? For um, the, uh, all I of was the different basically uh, running while making the game. So uh, some of these maps I was actually developing even while we were actually in session. So, um, cause they were advancing more fast than I had expected right. and I had kind of started the game early. So there was a lot of maps I needed to make. Uh, there was a lot of content I needed to make between each week. Uh, cause sometimes we were playing multiple games a week. 
So uh, each game could go through multiple maps. So I had to have an adequate content prepared ahead of time that I knew they weren't going to run into a spot. Uh, they did actually end up running into a spot where I actually ran out of content, which was uh, towards the end of the game, and I had to stop a little early. But um, I think, uh, let's see, that was Eurofax, right? So uh, that was the first map, and then we had to stop there after the second map. So between the span of those games, I created... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight maps uh, within, I think, less than a week. So I actually think it was like more, more like four or five days. So, um, yeah, the, and then, of course, at the same time, I'm also creating the unit graphics. I talked about those in your previous podcast. Right. Uh, which uh, can be like editing the portraits or the full body tokens or something like that. Uh, there was a number of those I had to process. Any one of those can take a day. Um, that's another uh, something else that's usually sort of time sensitive. Uh, so in the game, the the main campaign that I'm running right now, they're in a large area. There's a lot of different stuff. They can run it. They could basically have much. It's not as linear as Albion. They can go in many different directions. So I have to prepare each session ahead of time based on where they currently are, uh, on the pretense that they actually could change any direction at any point in time and just go somewhere else, and um, end up in some area. Um, that's you know not where I'm thinking they're going to be. So I have to be prepared enough ahead of time that I can handle anything that they can throw at me uh, so we don't run into issues. Right. So that means having the maps and the unit assets and the stat blocks and everything up and ready to par. Now, I don't base any of my stuff on the uh, source content. I haven't looked at source content for years now um, because, quite frankly, it's useless. It's terrible. The The original content for, like, the, the monster manuals and stuff like that is just awful. There really isn't. Like, there's some neat ideas in it, but the vast majority of them are all copy-pasted off of each other. It's just, like, unit with magic resist and devour. Great. Fantastic. Or it's just a unit with a default spell list, and that's it. Like, there's, there's really a few, very, very few interesting things in there. So I had to devise actual mechanics and fights and stuff like that all from scratch. And uh, since some of the party members are using, like, uh, basically, like, beta stuff from Unearthed Arcana and rolled for stats and stuff like that, the original balance really doesn't apply anymore. There's custom systems and erratas and stuff I've done. So I have to count for kind of a lot when I'm doing this uh, while also trying to make each... My goal, one of my goals is to make each individual fight stand out. Uh, even if it's against the same monsters, I try to have unique compositions or unique twists of the fight or certain stuff that uh, changes things up and the monsters uh, even my most simple of monsters in here has m like five or six times as much uh, custom stuff in it as the CR 30s in default D&D &D. Uh, the bosses and stuff like that might have a default mage spell list and then magic resist and a melee attack and then fear aura and then devour and that's it that's like the most complicated unit in the entirety of game um, whereas my level one units usually have like a whole bunch of different stuff. Like there's a little night nightmares that can, uh, uh, devour dreams and stuff like that. Uh, they have a bunch of, uh, environmentally conditional movement systems. Uh, they have a multi-attack with a fear component and stuff like that. So just like little level one things are fairly complicated. So I had to devise all that. And a lot of this stuff was not built for the game already. So... There's a lot of like thinking ahead of time, like, okay, so how am I going to make a fight? How am I going to make that fight interesting? How am I going to make that fight interesting in the context of the rest of the campaign? You know, based on the information of the previous encounters of the group, how can I create something that's unique for this particular group in this particular campaign? How can I engage this particular group? And um, stuff like that. So uh, ultimately what turned out is I had really an underestimated how much damage the party can put out. So they could put out about 500 damage or something within a span of two rounds or less. I think it was less. So that was enough to kill a CR-30 in uh, two rounds. Um, minus the arbitrary spell reflect that a lot of the default CR-30s and CR-20s have in the DMG. But uh, in terms of raw numbers, they were putting out way higher than our party normally would. Um, in part because of custom weapons and in part because of the way their builds and luck worked out. So um, a lot of the design really just is like, it could play out this way, but it doesn't. So D&D uh, &D is kind of flexible in many ways. You end up 
really improvising a lot of how certain stuff happens. A lot of interactions happen in these fights that were not premeditated. So a lot of my pre pre prep uh, for the game world and the setting, uh, since it's based on the Apex world, I have already devised like an underlying psionic system, an underlying element system. You know, I already know how subspace works. I already know how the different like planes work and stuff like that. I've replaced all of D and D with this stuff, so I know how a lot of stuff works. So when something unexpected happens, certain interactions that don't get covered in the rules, I can rule right off the bat how it would work in my system, and it really expedites a lot of stuff. So I really like focus on the actual asset creation because the assets are what are the most important. I can't really do those on the fly. I can't make maps on the fly. I really don't want to be in a spot where I'm doing that. Uh, this is also on my old system where baking the lighting for a lot of these maps takes upwards of half an hour to an hour plus. And I had to be super conscious about the light map resolution. I wanted them to look good, but uh, each individual light map was uh, potentially going to crash my com uh, all of Unreal 4 or my entire computer from memory. Uh, running out of memory since i only had 12 gigs of ram i was really pushing it building light mass on this and you cannot multitask with unreal 4 on 12 gigs of ram so i couldn't do anything else while i was working on the maps so today i can multitask more with my newer system but uh, back then it was very much like a segmented process i couldn't be working on roll 20 or on unit graphics or anything of that nature while working in the maps. So when I went into Unreal 4 and started working on this stuff, I had a very, very clear set goal by the restrictions that I had to get something done with this, and I had to do it like fairly quickly because I wasn't able to do anything else while I was waiting anyways. So having the maps out was really important. If I had the maps out and I had the unit tokens, uh, anything else I could usually come up with on the fly. Uh, how any interactions or work or stuff like that uh, what the maps contain in terms of information would be basically improvised all on the spot so when I looked at the project I devised you know what is my strengths so I'm really strong at improvising content on the fly I don't pre-plan a lot of the stuff the maps have in terms of like what each individual uh, piece in the map has here I'll send you a more complicated map so you can take kind of like take a look at what I mean um uh, here's a map from Eurofx. So in this map from Eurofx, uh, the players uh, come in from the north. And then in the bottom right is an NPC that becomes their friend and a boss encounter. And that is actually all I worked into this, walked into this with. I had the layout of the map in my head when I walked in, and then I cobbled it together, uh, fitting the theme of the area. Which you can tell is kind of a lot like StarCraft in many ways. It's very much like a science fiction kind of area, but it's also sort of like uh, like cobbled together and, and sort of like makeshift. It's also a blend of two different kinds of technology as well, so I wanted to have that polarity between it where it looks both incomplete and damaged and also very evidently two different kinds of architecture blended together. So uh, it's a mix of Unreal Tournament 3 assets and uh, Infiltrator demo assets that have all been, uh, all their materials have been hand edited uh, to make them work well with orthographic because metallic and stuff like that doesn't work in orthographic at all. So uh, the party ends up investigating a lot of what's going on. They investigate like those uh, pillars to the left. Uh, they investigate some of the components inside the uh, room with uh, the kind of goofy looking blood in it, which is very difficult to do. Um, they investigate a little bit of uh, some other areas here and um you know all like what those have on them what they derive from them what information i learn from them i know what the facility is and what it contains and what information is there i don't write down ahead of time what this stuff has and i don't even actually think about that when i'm making the map i only think about what it makes sense for the map to have and then when it actually comes to the gameplay then i improvise all that on the spot because I know I can do that, so I don't actually think about that ahead of time. My sole priority when building the content is to have the content, the palette, so to speak, that I will then build that interactive experience with. So the actual interactive experience, I don't even really think about too much about that, except what I want, like the really like the major bullet points. Like I want this room to be a boss encounter. I want this room to have this particular feature in it. Like it's, I'll I'll have something premeditated like that. But when it comes to actually 
you know, deploying a lot of the smaller details and stuff like that, it's all left to the actual game. I don't even, like, I don't write anything down. I don't take any notes. I don't keep text files for this stuff. It's, I actually have only one text file for one character that has some of the history and stuff in it, just so I don't forget it. Everything else is maintained in my head or improvised on the spot. And throughout all that, I have managed to uh, maintain complete and total consistency. So... There, there is the odd time I sometimes forget it's about something, but it's usually quite minor and quite rare. So uh, that's like a strength that I have where improvisation is super, super easy. So I rely a lot on that. So uh, I design a lot of my workflow around like what my strengths are. So let's say, for example, in StarCraft, um, you know, say StarCraft 2 or, or Unreal 4 or something like that. Uh, there will be certain things that I know for a fact that I can do, that I can do at like a very good level, like audio, for example. I don't worry about making my sound effects or assembling my soundtrack or stuff like that. That's something I have absolute confidence in. I look at what I'm going to struggle the most with, and I focus a lot on that. This also plays a lot into my time management, because if I end up putting something off, that is very difficult. It's very hard to get into it. It's very hard to find that excuse to get into it. It's very hard to like mentally uh, justify placing time into attempting it. Like you will generally want to go with the flow rather than fight against it. You'll want to do something that you're more comfortable with. So as a rule of thumb, I always try to do the most difficult things first. Because it's much easier to walk downhill than uphill, I find. And especially in light of all the other stuff I talked about and rambled about. You know, all the shit that's going on in the background. If you can get over the big hurdle, it's much easier to take a step down the road. So, you know, I try to tackle the really big things. Like, the difficult stuff is definitely making the maps, making them look good, being able to light bake them, figuring out the read issues on them. Like, the lighting and shadow and stuff like that is really difficult. The depth issues is really difficult. I struggled with that on quite a few of the organic maps, uh, especially when the crater maps, it was really hard to, to convey that it was actually a crater you were descending. Well, also, being mindful of the game mechanics and the way that, that you know, D&D handles stuff. And uh, being able to facilitate, you know, potential combat encounters on these maps and, and making sure they, they are relatively easy to read from a combat perspective. Like, this is a ledge. This is not a ledge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like a, not a slope, but a series of layers to it. So um, it's really about first making sure that the most difficult and most uncertain variables are accounted for first. So that for one, it's easier for you to coast down and manage the rest of your time. So if you're really struggling like me with, you know, other stuff and, and other stressors, you know, you don't want to be multitasking stressors. You don't want to be bearing too much load. So if you've got something that you want to do, but there's something really, you know, critical and difficult about it, you want that done right away. You want to take that out right away because there's no point in putting it off and being you know, worried about it or dependent on it or questioning about it or whatever for any longer than you need to. So for me, for the D&D stuff, that is especially the maps. So right now in the campaign, I have a bunch of areas that actually need custom maps and they're going to be hard. So I have put those off because of the shit that's been going on right now. I haven't had the desire to get into them. So what has happened is instead I've done low-hanging fruit. I've done unit tokens. I've done some of the other maps I can use third-party assets for. You know, I've, I've basically like padded around the edges and kind of skirted around the responsibility. But now I'm saying, you know, right up front, I need to make these maps because the players are thinking about going into these areas next. I am actually out of time now. I have to think about doing this stuff very soon within this week. And, you know, it's already the end of Tuesday. I have half the week has already disappeared and I don't know what is to come. So at this stage, you know, I have to get that done. So I'm in a situation I don't want to be in for precisely this reason. I'm starting to get really stressed out about time. When I'd much rather be about more like, how can I make use of my time rather than, you know, how much time do I have left? I find that this a lot of the equations and a lot of the difficulties and, and when it comes to things like motivation and stuff like that, it really comes down to how you approach things with a certain mindset, how you're viewing certain things. So... In the last podcast, I talked about how I saw certain things as a challenge. 
Uh, like removing watermarks from images. It can be really tedious, but there is a certain satisfaction in removing watermarks. In the same way, there is a certain satisfaction to piracy and stuff like that. For some reason, people went through the effort of denying you something, and you went through the effort of figuring out how to get it. And now you have it, and now it's yours, and that's that. And, you know, there's like this is the same case for a lot of people who defeat encryption and stuff like that. They don't want to do it just to steal stuff. They want to do it just because it's encryption. It's there to be defeated. They see it as a challenge, so they defeat it. A lot of people, they don't even release their information. It never even ends up being like public cracks or, or decryptors or anything like that. It's just something that they're interested in, something that excites them. You know, a new you know, cryptology or encryption method has come out, and they want to break it because it's that's what it's there for. It's there to be broken. It's like a puzzle they want to solve. And... In some respects, you know, seeing a challenge in, in some of the stuff that I do is like that, you know, like the maps and stuff like that. Like, to me, the reward is, you know, seeing the players go through it. And that's a lot different than my traditional content that I made, mostly for myself. But, um, you know, like I've said before, it's more of a personal interaction. And there's more reward in it to me than, you know, releasing something to the public or being part of a team or something like that. There's much more reward in pushing something to a specific few people group of people that I know and then seeing them interact with it and helping them interact with it and being a part of that interaction and, you know, being up close with that. And, uh, you know, it's, I go through a lot of work for what basically amounts to maybe like they may spend like an hour in each map and then that's it where I spent like days to potentially, potentially even weeks on certain maps, uh, just for that one hour. But if that one hour is an amazing experience, that's all that can be. That's all I can make it. Then that, is what justifies it to me. So, you know, it's kind of like when you look at gameplay lengths, how I talked before, how the vast majority of games today, they have less content in 20 hours than something like R-Type 3 has in 10 minutes. Because in 10 minutes, r 3 keeps handing you unique content over and over and over and over again. And it tends to be skill testing content as well. And I really can't say the same about all this trash that's come out, like, you know, say Half-Life or DMC5 or whatever. You know, it's just bland and empty and sterile at the best of times and it's just it isn't content there's just nothing really engaging about all this stuff it's all about really just distracting you from the lack of content so i really try to focus a lot like you were talking about um uh what was it um uh, making use of your uh your potential yeah living up to it and this is sort of the same way and I think D and D and and stuff like it is extremely unexplored. I think that the whole concept of role play and engagement and stuff like that is unexplored, and that's why I've always talked about things like using you know AI to tell your story and stuff like that, because nobody does that. Nobody attempts to do that. It's just it's not a thing. Nobody really thinks about using gameplay to create experiences, even though that's really what a game is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about a medium of entertainment that uses interaction to entertain. Well, how many fucking games do that? Very few. Very few even make the attempt. But D&D by design is supposed to be like that. So why is everything so bland? Why is all the stock maps that come with it so ugly and awful? Why is the DMG so boring? You know, there's so much about it that just is screaming for someone to come in and turn it into something that has potential. And to me, really, like, the net result is to have that immersive experience, that elusive cinematic experience. But something that takes place within, you know, the theater of mind that uses assets and stuff to help shape those images in your mind, and you can end up with something that's really quite unique, at the very least. And that's really my goal. You know, that's really my goal. And I've taken in, you know, two people who... No, four people who really aren't experienced in the the whole role play thing and at least two of them uh, i'd say at least three of them came out you know being substantially affected by the stuff i was doing you know the the feedback that i got was very positive in that respect in that i changed what a lot of people actually expect out of content not because I reviewed something, not because I broke something down, not because I analyzed something, just because I delivered content. 
you know, I was finally able to deliver something to them that I've been trying to deliver for years and years and years. And I did it through a platform that was really suitable for it. And it wasn't perfect. It was definitely a lot I can learn. You know, I'm still always trying to learn things about d and I'm always, you know, working to improve and perfect. And there's still a lot of stuff I know I'm really weak in. But, you know, with what I was able to do, I was able to really establish a connection with people who weren't even role players, who weren't even really, like, like they, some of them are D and D players, but they they played like very low role play, very low key, like real life stuff. And I walked in with an online game using digital images over the fucking stupid internet, reading text, and we somehow managed to create that experience. And that's really like what you want, you know. If you're going to use something that's specifically like a gameplay medium, an interactive medium, like you know a digital game, you want to use that through digital stuff. And it's true that D&D is very in large part about like combat and stuff like that. Like the vast majority of your character sheets about combat. But it's also about like using that as a facility to abstract storytelling. Like that, that's what the whole dice thing is there for. It's a storytelling mechanism. So, you know, we flip we flip around and we try to create that cinematic experience through the actual tools of writing, but with an interactive medium to it. It's very different. It cannot be done in digital media. You cannot replicate stuff like D&D and digital media, and people really should just stop trying because they're never going to succeed. And the, all the attempts are incredibly embarrassing, like Divinity Original Sin is just cringeworthy at the absolute best of times. But um, you know, we've, I think we have managed to achieve that in my projects, and that, to me, is more important than all the stuff I've done in all of my time modding, period, combined. So... That is in part what what keeps me going. To me, it's less about like the potential for myself because I think I've reached my limit quite a while ago. But I think that what flexibility there is for me is not in potential, but in execution. And execution is really important. It's about like learning how to manage how, where my energy goes. I have very limited amounts of energy and. I tend to be kind of wasteful with it and I don't know how to direct it. And I don't know how to best use it. So uh, like, for example, when writing in the game, I tend to be very brief because I'm not comfortable with spot writing at all. It's my worst, weakest skill as spot writing. And I mean, that shows in, in the podcast too, like premeditated is a little more coherent than what I usually spew out on a podcast. But um, in the game, it's a lot harder. Yeah, so you I tend said to be very that brief. you, Sorry to cut you off there. You you said you you feel like you don't you you've reached your limit, including the stuff that you're pointing out right now, like including the stuff you're yeah. talking about right now. Yeah. Why is it that you feel like it's there's some gap or some not gap but a a cap, I guess, on your ability to improve mm-hmm. in that sense? I have reached a point where there's so much diminishing returns and how much energy I can put in trying to learn something that I cannot gain anything from it anymore. Uh, let's take for example 3D modeling. So I have been working with 3D graphics since 2001. And when I walked into the NRL 4 project, I realized I had to use Blender because 3ds Max doesn't behave well with the smoothing groups or some of the animations coming out of the WoW model viewer or Unreal 4. And only Blender's importer would handle those. Now, it's true Blender's interface is absolutely rancid and it's, it's awful to work with, but the skills that I still had to work with, uh, namely being animation and UVing and texturing and uh, uh, bone weighting and, and rigging and stuff like that, I realized um, while it was true, I was able to repurpose a lot of animations in 3ds Max uh, by moving bones per frames. So it's not really the way you're supposed to do things, and there's a lot of limits to it. When it came to the prospect that I actually had to learn a new skill, I realized I couldn't do it. I read you know, a dozen plus articles. I watched dozens and dozens of videos. And I, sure, I understood the information well enough, but actually executing it was not possible. It wasn't possible for me to do all this stuff. I came to realization that actually, even though I've been working with 3D graphics for close to 20 years, I knew fucking nothing. I mean, that was obvious before because all I could ever do is box modeling by extras. I can't make organics. And now I was working with organics, and I was really in over my head. And I understood concepts. I understood, you know, fundamentals and ideas, but execution was actually impossible. And I had to accept that I just was not actually capable of doing graphics. So I just gave up. 
because even though I invested about two months in trying to fix animations for this, I was actually getting nowhere. I wasn't improving, I wasn't learning, I wasn't really expanding my tool set. I wasn't able to expand it because this is the exact same thing I had so many problems with for years and years and years and years, is I really just can't turn this information into actionable energy. Now, this is applicable to other stuff too. I have been writing since I was a toddler. So for over 25 years, I've been writing. And I haven't improved as a writer in those 25 years either. My strongest writing was in 2009. And I am still flabbergasted today when I read my any of my old writing that I was actually able to write that, especially in such a short time, because I can't write that well anymore. I can't use words that well anymore. I can't structure sentences that well anymore. Um, I'm actually losing information. I'm losing skills as time goes on. I'm regressing. And that's bad, obviously. But it's also an indicator that I've I already plateaued a long time ago and the only way further now is down uh, where I'm actually losing skills and the same is actually true with my audio skills as well I have forgotten how to voice act at this stage I no longer have like I have a confidence I can do voice acting for a project but not to the extent I used to be able to do I would actually probably employ third parties to do my editing for me at this stage because I no longer feel confident that I can do editing towards my standards now at this stage either it's true that my standards have also increased since then, but this actually comes from as, as a result of me trying to do uh, practice runs and experiments and stuff like that and realizing I have actually forgotten everything. And I read through all my notes and all my documentation and stuff like that, and I was like, nope, I can't do this anymore. So um, I've actually significantly resist, or regressed in all my strongest skills, and uh, I don't really have a means to expand out for them like they had they had reached a point before where i knew i couldn't expand from them because uh like say for example audio editing there was no resources to learn from at all there was no way to improve my audio editing because plain and put there was there was nothing i could learn from only my own experimentation taught me what i knew there was never any individual i've ever met actually in my entire life who possessed audio skills uh, in what I was doing, even comparable to mine. There was someone who I talked to who knew how to do processing uh, a little bit better than me that introduced me to tools such as, you know, Ozone and stuff like that. And I learned a lot from him, like, about how to deal with multiband compressors and stuff like that. But, you know, as a result, this was from him experimenting in much the same way that I was. So I basically was down to finding people of that similar background who knew very specific things that I didn't know and learning little odds and ends from them. And I just sort of like had like this chimera of information without anything really tying it together. In some respects, I also think it's as a result of not having a real dedicated project to stick to for so long. The most of my audio editing, for example, has gone into LPs and stuff like that. And most of what I've learned over the last few years has actually been about analysis and uh, like training my eyes and my ears more than training actual development skills. So you could see it as like getting rusty or a decay, but it's also that, you know, you reach a point where you can no longer see a step to take. If you're walking up a staircase trying to grow, but the steps suddenly disappear, that's where I'm at. There is actually no tangible area. Like, you know you want, you can see where you want to go, but you don't know how to get there. Like say, for example, I would love to be able to just fucking rake this, fucking World of Warcraft model and animate the whole goddamn thing from scratch. And yet somehow Balathal has basically done that. He's animated something from scratch, and I haven't been able to dream of doing that for 20 years because of my learning disabilities and struggling with motivation and everything related. Every single time I've come to experimenting with that, for some reason, when it comes to actually walking the walk, I can't do it. And it doesn't really matter what tool set I'm working with either. It doesn't matter if it's Max, Maya, or Blender, or something in between. I just can't figure it out otherwise i would have been making cgi back in uh 2010 as opposed to playing with starcraft 2 it probably would have resulted in a <laughs> a much more impressive lineup of work than i have to show today because uh there was a very big decisive moment where i was uh looking to try to make uh basically uh, full cgi movies within 3ds max back in 2009 and 2010 and that was why i had bought the system i had at the time of the i7 uh, was to pursue that in Project Offset, and neither of those panned out. So that took me down the road of StarCraft 2, and we all know how that turned out. 
Summer and Wilson's doubled chin and chromosomes. <sighs> so what that means is that, yeah, I think that uh, there is actually no way for me to actually improve. I can learn some odds and ends. You know, like, for example, in the image editing with Crida, I'm learning little strategies and stuff like that. But I'm not an artist. I'm not learning how to create art. I'm learning how to butcher things. I'm learning how to reverse engineer things. But I'm not really learning an actionable skill set. If you ask me to create something, I can't. So, you know, it, it's useful for the very edge fringe case I do, but I don't constitute that as improving. I don't constitute that as, you know, realizing potential. If I was to be realizing potential right now, I would really be trying to, you know, probably learn like programming and stuff like that. Although I have to say there is some entertainment to be had out of, uh, I know a lot of programmers and when they try to teach me programming stuff, watching their frustration is actually really entertaining to me because I'm so stupid that I just, like, I just really don't understand the basic shit. Well, in that, that particular case, I'm with you because I'm no good at programming either. So <laughs> you share some company, but, uh, don't you think that there's at least a, a chance here based on your past experience and your knowledge of your own limits and your own disabilities, as you just elucidated, but also the fact that you have been able to learn odds and ends. And even if you, un, you uh, understandably, you claim that they are not the same thing as learning how to create something or learning a technique that will help you in more general use cases, you're still capable of learning and you've demonstrated that just based on the fact that you're able to do the dnd stuff that you can do now i mean don't you consider that as progress as learning as some sort of advancement mm, in your really. ability no i it, to me it's it's immeasurable as progress it's just because i think that like to me potential is something that really only exists if you stand to realize it and i think that Everybody has potential to do anything they really want unless they have major mental disabilities like I do. But there is another layer to this filtering, and that is your environment. And an environment really has to facilitate growth and learning. And I'm not just talking about, you know, your finances, your living situation, anything like that. I'm also talking about you, your head, your ability. Some people can deal with stuff really easily. You know, most people probably hear, you know, that I had to go out and I just laugh. Because to them, like socializing and going outside and dealing with other people and stuff like that, it's something they do every single day. It's something, you know, they have no problems with. But for me, what actually happens is if I am even faced with the prospect of a situation like that, I actually shit my guts out. <laughs> like, I literally get so stressed out that I instantly have diarrhea, and all I get a lot of muscle pain, and I get a lot of eye twitching, and, like, my whole body really starts to shut down. I get a lot of acid reflux and stuff like that. And um, because the, the stress response is so enormous. And way back... I used to talk to somebody who would tell me that they would, you know, get so stressed that they'd actually throw up. And at the time, you know, I still, I've been, I've been dealing with this stuff for all my life. But at the time, I thought that was kind of weird. You know, even by my standards, that was kind of weird. But today, it's like, yes, I can understand that because I've actually had to deal with that. I've actually been so stressed up, I've thrown out. So it's, it's one of those things that you can't actually really quantify. So what ends up happening is when you think about, like, someone learning something, I think for most people, it's so simple that they just sit down and do it. That That's the way it seems to me. Is like, I watched a lot of people, like, they, they work on a project or something like that. They want to learn modeling. They sit down with 3ds Max. In a year, they're making Blizzard-quality CGI. They've got fully skinned, high-poly, high... Um, you know, high resolution stuff, fully animated, fully rigged. You know, they can do whatever they want with it, and it looks really good. And they're really, really skilled. And now, you know, if they wanted to, they could go get a job or something like that. I don't know why they'd bother wasting their talent on somebody else's shit. But if they want to, they can. You know, these people just self learn. They just pick up stuff. That's the vast majority of people I know is that they can just learn that stuff. But at the same time, their environment. And their personality sort of facilitates that, where they can sort of set for themselves a goal and somehow management, manage it. 
I don't know them well enough to tell you how they did it. Honestly, I wish I, w- I wish I could know. I don't think I would learn anything from their skills in the same sense that when I listen to your story, it, you know, it, it to me, it just seems so arcane and, and distant and unfathomable that you can sit down and maintain a schedule, much less everything else. And yet yeah, that's what you do, right? Like, obviously, that's what you do. You know, the proof is in the effort, you know, the, the end result. And that's just the kind of person you are. That's just the kind of environment that enables that. The mental environment, the mental landscape that can facilitate that kind of interaction. Well, Mine I doesn't think allow that. There's something to be said for, obviously, the the actual biological, neurological, chemical differences that any human being or any pair of human beings would have, right, when contrasted against themselves. But yeah. I, I'm still, like... I guess it's the kind of mental stuff that you're talking about when it comes to just a predisposition or a personality trait or some sort of default thing. I mean, I can't really claim that it's a default aspiration of mine to just constantly work and constantly be doing stuff because when I'm not doing that, if, for example, I uh, even I so far as uh, so much as sleep in for an hour or two, I still do the work. Eventually, I still do get up and stream, but the temptation is not there at all when I wake up at six in the morning and I get up out of bed that it feels really good to do that it feels like uh it's like the best way to start your day is to actually get up on time as as you scheduled and you you feel like you got a good night's rest obviously and then like on top of that you're able to say like well you know I'm up at the crack of dawn it's there's something about that that while on the one hand like the the lazy part of your body or the lazy part of your personality or whatever just shudders at the thought of it alone but the the part of your body that or the part of your personality that wants to get shit done is like overjoyed with the even the opportunity to get up at that hour and and get to work and just that just that change alone where i was able to wake up at that hour with enough energy to actually get up out of bed shortly after actually waking and you know get my shit together just that change alone allowed me afforded me opportunities that previously like i basically made opportunities for myself based on that alone because it's not like they weren't there to begin with the opportunity was technically always there but for whatever reason i didn't ever even see it there it's like something opened up in that mental pathway like to, to even get the work done opened up based on this decision that i had done so in a way i made the opportunity even though the opportunity was always there it's just like you, you don't recognize it until you yourself bring it into the world and, or bring it into your world. And so that, that's where I think like the mind defeats itself and the mind also claims victory for itself, depending on what you do. That, that's what it seems to me. It seems to me that when you put your mind to something, you can do whatever that something is. And until you recognize a formula to constantly engage in that loop where you're constantly putting your mind to something and taking uh, to it within the morning or whenever you're able to do so uh, with the discipline required, the motivation is a byproduct of that process. And it's not something that you need to like nurture in the same, to the same degree. It's like shit flies up in your face. uh, Like I, when I had to move recently And there was the initial period of dread that always happens whenever something has to change like that, that that always shows up. And then we did it and uh, I was able to just start adapting and like that, that would have been incomparable, even if that had happened like a year ago to the to the day, I probably would have spent a lot longer uh, fucking around in my head trying to figure out like like obsessing over minute details of like when we were going to move this and what we were going to do about moving that and. Um, you know, maybe you can just, I I guess it's like, okay, it's the difference between this. It's like, sometimes you'll look at a situation that you're in and you'll say, this is some shit fucking luck. And equally, sometimes you'll say, wow, we really got by by the skin of our teeth or that was really lucky. That was really fortunate that it happened that way. And when you're overthinking stuff or when you're just thinking about stuff a lot, regardless of whether or not you want to put a value judgment on it, you start to forget that attribute at all like the whole idea of fortune the whole idea of luck you start to think like you're obsessing too much over minute details and uh it's like the opposite like you said your strengths are when you just 
fly off the handle and and you by the seat of your pants you don't really worry about pre-planning everything like you obviously have to do some production work but when it comes to the showtime you're able to improvise on the spot a lot of the times and you know like what you're able to improvise Mm -hmm. versus what you're not able to improvise you're not able to improvise like spot writing like you were saying and and graphics on the on the fly you don't like to put yourself in positions where you have to do those you have to rely on those so you like you work towards your strengths well what is like the the most destructive thing that you could possibly do mentally is probably like obsess over fine details and try to come up with like contingency plans on the spot that will really actually help you and like i don't know if you do this but this is something that i do all the time or i used to do before i got a handle on this is if somebody told me we're shutting the electric off you got to move in three days or whatever because three I would, for the next three days, rather than pack anything or get anything done on a functional level, do any of like the the corollary would be production to a D and D or something like this. Like if I had woke up and had a game to to get content for in three days, like a similar kind of situation, like the the panicking side of me, the the anxiety attack ridden side of me from like a year plus ago would have just freaked out for that time or most of that time and not really been using that time. Like I, I would have been bemoaning the situation of how I can't believe I only have three days to get all this shit done. And I would have been trying to come up with like a, a master plan to fix everything and like spend so much time on the theoretical side of shit that I don't get anything done or I don't get as much done as I need to. And the corollary is when I stopped worrying as much, when I was able to somehow like just have a cool enough head during most of that time, particularly with this moving stuff where I really did find out like less than a week, I had less than a week to plan for the move and talk to my mother about moving in at all. And like we had brushed on the topic a few times, but it wasn't until less than a week away from the actual day that I moved. Did I say, by the way, this is happening. Uh, Are we still good? (laughs) Because Like there's a very small (laughs) chance at that point that she says, no, we're not ready. And something I don't know what the fuck is going to happen then. But I didn't even think about that at the time. Like that's something that I think about now. Whereas before, like a year ago, I would have been upset obsessing over that until that step had been resolved. Whereas instead I just decided I was going to let her know and we would figure out what the result was after the fact. And like, it's sort of like efficiency of thought, like time management, but like thought management, like you have to manage how much time and like more over the cost on the, on your mental stress level of what you're like, what, what you're even going to allow yourself to do. You can get into a tyranny of thought so fucking easily if you do not really manage this stuff because what will happen is you'll think if a doesn't work then i've got to do b and if b doesn't work i have to do c and you'll go down the whole fucking list of the alphabet without knowing if a even works or not like without knowing if you even had to think about all the rest of that shit you can destroy yourself and that's basically what happens to me or what happened to me a lot of the time and i can still jump into that same sort of thought loop if i'm not really being diligent with managing that that sort of uh, overhead if you will or inner head i guess But that was something that was going on all the time. And so the way that it sinks all back is like, obviously, we had the example of your cat recently that you had to go and get uh, taken care of. And I'm sure like I'm jumping out on a limb here and saying that you probably had some symptom of what I was just describing, where you're in this tyranny of thought and you're considering all the worst case scenarios, maybe some of the better case scenarios, everything that you would have to do if X or Y was true before you really had any actionable information to use. And so like what it comes back to is you made a a brief statement about potential and how you weren't really interested. Like you you didn't think that potential existed unless you actually were able to do something about it. And I Mm -hmm. wonder if you've gone way far past, like down the alphabet in my example, and you've gone past a, like if I can't do a, then maybe I can learn to do B or if technique a doesn't work to teach me something, maybe technique B will do it. I wonder if you've like, obviously you've had a lot of experience trying this. I'm not suggesting that you just gave up. Uh, like apropos of nothing, but I wonder if you've already gone past that and you have like, you've gone past all of the the steps with like, again, in this tyranny of thought and you've, you've gotten too much in your head about stuff like that, just the same way that you would do in a crisis situation, but obviously over a longer period of time. And perhaps by just being fucked over by a lot of people down the years and being becoming jaded in that sense, I wonder if you've had a similar situation happen here where like you've, you've already decided it made up in your head that this is how you're going to go, how you're going to approach stuff. And you, you know, you already like, I guess at what point do you decide whether or not it makes sense to re like open an investigation of your own, like what your, your capabilities are now versus what they could be if you did X or Y 
and then so on. Like, I know I'm, I'm kind of throwing you a, a big fucking question here, but maybe you can make some sense of it. No, no, uh, it is definitely a, th- a thing. Overthinking is definitely a problem. This is why uh, I mentioned before that uh, I got rid of the yeah the the list that uh, you priorities have. list. Right. Um, that's is for a very similar reason because I was overthinking the whole process. And you know, like I said, the cast I just decided to do on the spot, like you know, Danny's Inferno and, and DMC Five and stuff like that. Uh, they were all completed on the spot because I did them on the spot as fast as possible without really, you know, thinking things through and just being like, yeah, oh, well, well you were playing with your strengths there where you're just improvising based on what you feel yeah. like it's the same kind of thing. I feel like, yeah, there, there's, that's definitely a big problem. I think it's a problem. A lot of people run into, I mean, I think that there's a good balance. Like, I think it has to be balanced depending on, on the kind of project. Like if you're going to jump into something that really demands a lot of focus on it like say for example an Unreal 4 project I would say you need to have some kind of risk management associated with it but when it comes to things like general day to day work or you know something that like I, I would actually consider like like say for example moving and stuff like that day to day work because it's mostly physical labor it's not really something that really requires like a momentum to build up to actually doing it's something that every you know five minutes you put into it really contributes to it you know, packing or moving or whatever, like it's something you really need to devote a lot of time into. But it's still, that still does happen where you get hitched on a lot of stuff. Um, because when this was, you know, when this was something that my grandmother was telling me about on that day, I basically like immediately had a massive meltdown and did nothing until the last minute. And then I was like, okay, I, I guess we're doing this. Um, because the stress just instantly became unmanageable. It was from like, you know, 10 to 100 in half a second. I was like, oh, all right, and then she was like, "I phoned a cab," and I was like, "Well, fuck." So, uh, we were she, she really threw you to the deep. fucking wolves, then, huh? Yeah, yeah, there was really not much choice. So, but that that is basically what, what had to get done because at that point I became sort of martial about it and mechanical about it um, because in such an instance, um, my stress management is mostly to become very robotic. Uh, it actually got harder to do. Usually things like that become easier to do when you go into them, but this actually became harder to do. Uh, since after we reached the vet and they basically, the examination didn't reveal anything, I you know, was realizing more and more and more that this was not a simple problem and that there's going to be more costs associated. And it actually gone through most of this for no reason at all. And now I was absolutely, this was you know the, the pinnacle. I realized we had to start manually feeding this cat or he is going to die. So yeah, uh, well, instantly realized, your brain went through the whole fucking alphabet, right? Yeah. Sort of situation. I realized at that point that the sheer workload that was right ahead of us, and then that's when the anxiety really hit. Um, also, I had to get a cab to go back too. So right, uh, yeah. That, so you start like, thinking about that, just, and yeah, yeah, and it just makes you sick to the stomach. So it's um, and then it was snowing again more at the same time. So I realized, oh no, you know the weather is going to make it even harder to get over here, and we don't have enough money for another taxi anyway. So. It was, uh, it, it was, it was like, honestly, a psychotic experience. And that's no exaggeration. It was a psychotic experience. And it really is a good example of what you're talking about. Cause that, that happens in all steps, you know, just casting the project and stuff like that. Um, like I want to get back into the Unreal project just because I got hooked up on the player character and stuff like that. Uh, but there is other stuff I can be working on and not worrying about that because eventually I'm pretty sure we can solve that. Um, yeah. Like I should do something. But I got hooked up on all this real life shit and now I'm behind on D&D work. And, you know, like I'm thinking too far ahead now. So I have to like pace myself and step back. A really good skill is to learn to really scale the way you think about things in relationship to your current like physical needs like there's your mental needs there's the projects you want to make but there's your physical needs what you're actually realistically capable of addressing at this point in time you know at this stage i have a to-do list a mile fucking long but i don't even think about it i was streaming dark souls i can't do that so sometimes people ask me about when i'm going to continue the randomizer run for dark souls one and i say well not now you know i can't even think about doing that now and you know people are just disappointed to hear that but i can't you know, I can't do it, so I just don't even think about it. I just set it aside. Uh, the editing projects, I set those aside. So I'm not going to do those now. I'll do them later. I'll have to take things at a time. I'll have to sort them out. And that's just like, again, you know, the physical 
is the important part about this. This isn't something I really can afford to expend mental energy on at this stage is to think about, oh, maybe I should do this. Maybe I should do that. It's at the stage where like, I have to do the D&D work because otherwise I'm going to reach a point where I actually have to start thinking about you know, canceling games because I'm not going to be able to, to have the content I need because I'm so far behind now. I can't do that. So I have to pace up what I work and catch up, which means I have to manage my expectations and scale what I'm thinking about. I can't think about the Unreal 4 stuff right now other than the maps I'm making. I can't think about the video projects that I was going to work. I have to really just focus, you know, needle point onto the set of goals I have ahead of me, making my maps, making my tokens, making the stat blocks, finding the music I need, so on and so forth, and then playing the games out and then catching up back on that. And then devoting the rest of my energy to the real life stuff that's going on right now. And then, you know, when we reach a comfortable spot about that, then I can think about, okay, you know, maybe I can start thinking about trying to get this WoW series tackled. So before I was always conscious a lot about completing projects. And I was very conscious about, you know, meeting the expectations of things I said I would do. And it still weighs heavily on my shoulder when I said, you know, I would finish this video or I would do that video or stuff like that. But you, I, I really force myself to just not really talk about that stuff anymore. Well, like, yeah, I that's another like thing I wanted to bring anymore, up, so. actually. So this is sort of unrelated and sort of related at the same time. But I noticed that, like, when I am going through some shit in the background that I don't talk about. Like when my grandmother died, uh, like I think it was two years ago. No, I think it was 2018. Um, no, maybe it was June. I, I don't, I really don't remember, but it was, it was within the last two years. And like, I didn't really bring that up, um, until like in any public facing manner, either through like, uh, just even casual discord messages or, uh, like private messages or on my YouTube channel, I tried to go through, just keep my nose to the grindstone of work, which is, I guess, a way of coping with it. But I also didn't bring it up as like when people would ask where something was or why I wasn't streaming as much or why I wasn't doing X or Y or when I was going to do X or Y, like you were just giving the example of the Dark Souls thing. Like rather than say, like give them a whole bunch of shit and be, or like not, not like uh, yell at them, but like give them emotional baggage basically by saying like, uh, this is what happened recently. We got through a death in the family, blah, 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 blah. And uh, it, I'm sure they would be completely understanding in most cases. I wasn't really worried about their reaction, but it was like I found that when I just said I I can't really get to it right now, this is what I'm focusing on, uh, but I will be getting to it at some point or j maybe not even promise that. Just like let them know what I'm focusing on right now in the moment, which in your case would just be the D&D stuff. I found that that felt more empowering as a response because it wasn't like like obviously it's a, there's excuses that are valid and there's excuses that are just sort of like what most people consider when they hear the word excuse like just a lazy sort of apologistic way to absolve yourself from any responsibility like there's stuff that is legitimate and of course like a death in the family or a cat emergency in your case or anything like that would be a legitimate excuse but i wonder if like there's something about responding and sp like speaking or typing out like some sort of response that doesn't touch on any real, obviously tangible and uh, poignant and powerful uh, emotional shit or or stress related shit that you're going through. Like doesn't really bring that up and just says like is very uh, dismissive, I guess, of the situation in a sense. Like I wonder if that gives you back some control in some way and like a more uh, uh, neurological sense or, or whatever. Like like sort of kneecaps the, um, the amount of stress and makes you think back and like. Here, the here and now, the the living in the present, like the grounded reality. This is what you are working on. This is what you're working towards. Like goes brings you back and levels you out in a sense. I wonder if that helps because I felt that it was super empowering in that sense where I was going through an uh, emotional time, but rather than use that as even like uh, a legitimate excuse, like I was mentioning, rather than even bring it up in response to somebody asking where something was or what the timetable of something was just giving them what I was focusing on right now and, and leaving it at that or letting them know that I was still intending to do what they were asking. But right now I'm focused on something else that felt more like, uh, for one, it motivated me to do whatever the fuck I was just talking about. Like if I said, um, this is my focus, then I kind of felt like I had to live up to actually saying that and not just use it as a, like a, a lie more or less to, uh, brush out the, the lack of content or for that particular time. Um, 
so I, I felt empowered to, to live up to my word, obviously. But like beyond that, it, it feels like it mitigates the d- disaster response in your head and it might help supersede that or kneecap that that feeling that you like need to go through the whole alphabet of, of if X, then Y or whatever and, and try to like, like it, I think it just does keep you present in that sense. And I think keeping yourself present is super important, not just during times of of strife, but also when you are just in the the thick of development and you like you feel motivation waning or some other such thing. I feel like that can be super useful. And it's almost like, uh, I don't know what you think about this anyway. I don't know if you've had much experience with this, but like, I feel like it's almost, uh, by saying it to somebody else, by putting it in writing or just speaking it into existence, if you're in a voice chat or something, you almost make it true in some sense in your own head. And like you have that thought, but it's more than just like a tiny inarticulated thought It's an articulated thought. You had to say it, you had to speak it, you had to type it. And that makes it more real. And just by recording that down somewhere and knowing that there was like witnesses, whoever was ta- talking to you, asking the question, like that somehow makes it more like uh, meaningful or valid in, uh, in my head. I don't know if it has the same reaction for you or same result. Well, like I said, it's all a matter of perspective. Like for me, it's not as efficient or as effective because, you know, for me, like talk is just cheap. Anybody can talk. But actually like doing and providing the example for me is much more powerful, which is also obviously harder to do. But it, it speaks more more volumes about when you actually have something to show for the time you've, you know, otherwise readjusted or whatever. But no, it it is about perspective. <laughs> And um, sometimes asserting authority can sort of change your perspective on something. And sometimes that can be a little enough of a nudge to get you back on track or at least like remind yourself because you can drift in attention. And, you know, reaffirming direction can give you a little bit of a boost to get you back on track. And that can be helpful. You know, like today it's like uh, I finally have, you know, cream for my coffee and I can finally, uh, you know, drink coffee that is not bitter as shit. So now, you know, in the morning, I can have coffee and, and my day can start off a little bit, little bit better. And tomorrow, I'm going to have to go out yet again and uh, do more stuff. But, um, you know, I put I gave, like, the cat all their... Uh, I had to go AFK and give the cat a uh, drug, anti-nausea. And then that also is, like, an affirmation of a moment because it puts you in a moment of time where, like, yes, I did this, and you look at the time, and you're like, okay, so I have to do this in X hours. And then you frame out your time. What am I going to do until then? Uh, after this podcast is done, I'm going to go back and probably start up on Rail 4 and take a look at those maps and actually think about doing those now. Uh, just because I became more conscious of the time, not from a negative sense as, oh, I'm running out of time, but from the sense as I have something to do in six hours, which is give the other cat her drugs. So in six hours, that's not really enough time to do a lot right now. I can you know, uh, work a little bit on uh, video editing, and I can work on Unreal 4. I can verify this second segment for Schwa's game and stuff like that. So, you know, because I think about, I think in terms of time, I have to watch the video to verify it. That's an hour long. I can do that in six hours very easily, even if I have to pause it several times to go AFK. That's fine. And um, I can make some coffee and stuff like that. So, oh, this was, this, all this was established just by the fact that I actually had to do something. I actually had to get out and do something, uh, which was give the cat his drug. It, 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 it stood as an affirmation, a reinforcement of a moment. Because, a lot of people, I think, I know I will get distracted by something very easily. So something I'll actually end up doing is I'll get really lost looking for art. So I'm always looking for art to use for, you know, faces and tokens and stuff like that and maps and things. And sometimes I can be stuck on Yandex for hours and hours and hours because I will find nothing and I'll get really annoyed and I will just keep going until I find something because I don't want all my time to have been a waste. And yeah, sunken cost or whatever. Yeah, so I get stuck doing that, and then before I know it, it's two fucking a.m. I'm tired as shit, and I still have a lot of other stuff I need to do that didn't get done. So sometimes I need something to like kind of yank me out of there. Uh, sometimes that's just as simple as like a torrent finished for music, and I gotta go check it out, and then that will, you know, reaffirm some organization. I'll step back and be like, well, I guess I'll look for stuff later. So. Yeah, there is definitely many cases where you overthink stuff. There's definitely many cases where you get invested in this stuff, you know, very minor, like OCD kind of things. Or, you know, I mean, autism is really like that in general. You get really overly focused on stuff. It's one of the major defining traits of it. 
and for definitely for me for a long time it was writing um things related to me have to be sort of perfect and i get really frustrated if they're not perfect and i will get hitched on stuff for a really long time because one small thing is not quite right and that's a useful thing to have sometimes stubbornness can be very useful but in other cases it really it serves to be a problem because one of the things that will be useful in all this work is having uh, the ability to distance yourself from something and then look at it from a different perspective. Being able to assume a different persona, so to speak, or a different fursona, if you will, and assess something from a very alien perspective, a very different perspective. Some people will call it looking outside the box, but for me, that's different. Looking outside the box insinuates a more objective view. I'm actually specifically talking about a more subjective view. So there are, are depending on what I'm looking at, I may look, try to adjust, like say, for example, a token or something like that. I may uh, convert all the images, throw them onto roll 20 against the map or something. If I'm really struggling with like the appearances of editing something, I might like take a step back and say, how valuable is it actually to fix this? How will it be perceived in this environment? And is it actually worth the time? So I will very forcibly break myself, break my current workflow, break everything I'm doing and stick something into something and then look at it. So I was actually having this issue with uh, that image I mentioned a few casts ago. I spent over a week on, I thought it would only take a day. I was uh, redrawing one of the eyes, which was very complicated in particular because it was a very weird thing that I was drawing with it. And I was struggling a lot with so many different iterations. So I started asking myself, how valuable is it actually to be this perfect about it? Um, so I ended up breaking out and converting everything as is and putting it in at the resolution people were normally going to be saying it. And then I asked... So how would this look proper at this resolution? So normally I do everything in full resolution, the highest resolution either because I used waifu two times on it or the highest resolution that I could find it in uh, because I prefer to have the higher resolution art. But when you do things at the high resolution, you can focus a lot on basically like two or three or four pixels that are destined to get erased by the resize in game. Anyways, but... That doesn't mean you should ignore those pixels because they get averaged with lengths. So if you just ignore them, you end up with stuff like white speckles and places. And I mean, it's like the issue Bell all had was this marine that had like a right. stray pixel showing up on the head or something like that. So you can't just always ignore stuff. But sometimes the way in which you're addressing that stuff is an over-engineered solution. Uh, like the eye, for example, I was trying to copy over the other eye. I was trying to redraw the other eye and stuff like that. Uh, the iris and then the lens and then the perspective and the shape. And I was trying to adapt it to the other position of the face. Uh, when it turned out, all I actually need to do to accomplish what I want is just replicate uh, the sort of triangular shape of the pupil and then the rest of it, I could bullshit my way through, and it actually turned out looking really good, even at a high resolution. But the only way I actually really thought of doing that is by looking at it from a very small resolution with the work I had, and then comparing the two eyes, and thinking, why does this not look good at this resolution? It's because the shape was just too different and too weird. So if I just replicated the old shape, we ended up with something that was actually a good middle ground, and then at the high resolution, it was good. But I wouldn't have thought of that doing that at the high resolution, because at the high resolution, that detail really didn't seem like it mattered as much, but at the lower resolution, it did. So because I eliminated all the extra noise by basically giving me something very small to look at, and only the big defining shapes really showed through this, I went from basically, I think, uh, maybe 1400 by 1400, let's say, to 160 by 160 is quite a drastic difference. But I can highlight like some of the more major shapes that really define what the image actually looks like at a glance. And then that really, it points you to the pupils of the eyes. Those are the most defining things, not just the, the iris, but the, the, the pupil in itself. So that's what I focused on. And then that's how I was able to overcome that by just changing how I was viewing it from that perspective. And that's the same for a lot of things when you enter that sort of like OCD state where you really start to overthink things. That's usually a really clear indicator you want to take that step back and consider uh, reapproaching from a different perspective or distancing yourself from the equation altogether and then coming back after, you know, with a fresh set of eyes. 
being able to recognize that you're stuck in that can be hard, though. Well, for sure. I think uh, you, what you basically seem seems to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, it seems like you actually just went through and uh, put yourself in the viewport of what a, a player would be seeing, like at a glance, at a yeah. zoomed out resolution. You're like, that's basically what the player sees initially. So they don't pick out all the details. Like, obviously, you can't remove yourself completely from the equation, or at least it's very, very difficult to reach some sort of mental state where you can do that because you already know what the image is supposed to mean. And it's sort of similar to what I have to do to see if my work on the uh, dead doodads that I make for my projects uh, is actually correct. It's like there's such a small piece, even upscaled at 2x, uh, which is how most people play it. Uh, some approximation between two and two and a half times the resolution, like just upscaling it uh, based on if they play it in full screen at a modern resolution or if they play in windowed with the 2x feature enabled. So like uh, even if I look at it from the exact perspective of the player in terms of zoom, I still see all of the details that I know are there because I painted them there or I made them there in some way. And so like I imagine it's much the same situation with your stuff. And so when you're yeah. looking at it, it's hard to remove that part, but at least you see it from the perspective that they see. It. And that's a tool that uh, a technique rather that I've used so many times when working with terrain, uh, with working with any sort of art for this game is I always look at it at 200 percent zoom and maybe play around with something in between that and 300 percent and just try and see. Like if there's anything that jumps out at me and immediately and uh, sometimes I have the backup of the stream for that, which is, is helpful. But even just by myself, I'm able to resolve most of the issues based on that alone. And that can be a very powerful technique, I think, as you just uh, mentioned. But I also feel like there's something about the broader sort of conversation topic that this is uh, the idea that you get out of your own head for a moment and you look at what you're actually doing in the present, what you're actually working on, what you're working towards, like what is your immediate goal and how is this project, whatever this element is, like in this case, the token or the the portrait, like st- how is this art piece going to get me closer to the immediate goal of, of having more art for the project or whatever your immediate goal was. Maybe your immediate goal was just to work on that particular thing. In that case, then like, you know, what, what do I need to do? What's my next step? And being able to come back to the present instead of being lost in your thought you know, all all your thoughts that can be super useful as you mentioned, but also like that in and of itself is a kind of discipline. It's a kind of discipline to go through and say, like, I'm not going to get lost in my thoughts. I'm not going to allow like my subconscious to, to take control of this situation. I'm going to be very deliberate about what I'm thinking, what I allow myself to think about how it's sort of like a meditative state in a way where you obviously have to allow yourself to draw it to like you know your mind to wander in some sense but at some point you're able to reset and the more you can reset and the more you can be thinking deliberately about what you're doing the less automatic your stuff is when you're having to do something that that's creative and that's uh, that's demanding your focus the better uh your process generally is i think the more efficient you are because you it, it takes less time making a mistake to observe that it is a mistake and uh, less time to develop a, a correction for that mistake in the process and and so on and so forth like it's just it's like basic shit that you do when you're actually paying attention and you're really zeroed in and you're you're ready to go in that sense and so that i think is super important it's like a, an important observation that what you're like the, the small case example is is you becoming disciplined enough like like snapping out of your your state that you were in and going back into what you actually needed to do and and saying, I'm forcing myself to, like you said, like you're going to stop the flow of your work, which seems negative at a glance, but it's for the sake of getting a better perspective. It's for the sake of, you know, sort of reevaluating what your perspective is currently at all and whether or not it was the correct one to take. And so that I think is like a, a good way to sort of sum all that up in general, because that, that's important. That is something that everybody will benefit from doing and and getting into that meditative state where you're, you're focusing like people say focus on your breathing when you're doing meditation, basically. And and what it amounts to is like, obviously, you're going to be thinking about other shit, but you force yourself to stop thinking about that and think about your breathing. And it's like in this case, you're thinking about, you know, a bunch of shit in addition to the work you're doing. And so when you notice yourself thinking about shit that's not related, you snap out of it. When you fo- notice yourself thinking about stuff that is related but isn't really relevant to this exact point and is like far off in the future or, or even like in an hour or something, thinking about something that you have to do in an hour or thinking about what you want to be doing in an hour from now, like you, you snap yourself out of it. Like that active 
just just being active about your thought as opposed to autonomous. It kind of clashes with my next point, which I think is uh, you almost become a state machine when you're super disciplined. And it's like if you can make that process of not being automatic automatic, then like it's it's a weird way to explain it. There's a, there's a better way, I'm sure. It's kind of clunky. But like if you can make like habitualize the process of not being uh, lost in thought when you're trying to be focused, then you can go far pretty quickly, generally speaking. Like you can fix problems that you didn't think were possible to fix before. You can fix them quicker than you thought possible, even if you did conceive of a way to fix them. You can investigate shit in a quicker way and decide whether or not that's going to do it for you. That's going to work for you. Like you, you could just get work done faster. And and just by making that like a habit, making that disciplined element of your thought a habit, I think that can take you a, a pretty far stretch. And that, that goes for pretty much everything like that, that uh, autonomous habitualizing thing, like making it so that you are actually executing in a state machine. It, it's sort of all, it's like the same concept of not getting lost in thought, but it's like abstracted across every step of a project. Like when I'm working on a map, I'm not thinking about the whole map at once because that's overwhelming for my head. So I think about like just the area I'm terraining or just the the one AI I have to work on. And within that AI, like I, I go fractally deeper until I'm thinking of just the line of code. Like it goes from the entire AI to one line of code. And then that one line of code is in one function. And then that one function is part of this one task that I want the AI to do, like expand or attack or whatever. And then that one task is part of the entire AI. So you work your way back or you work your way forwards. You can do it either way. And the idea is that if you're able to just get yourself down to that that level of almost like a, a computer, like a machine. And you can get yourself into that state machine sort of habit uh, or pattern of thought. I think you can go pretty quick, pretty far uh, just on that alone before, you know, eventually it comes time to stop working for the day. And that could be like a way to enter that flow state that people talk about uh, where, where you really are able to get work done. And it comes much easier than it does otherwise. Like, I feel like you can dip into that a lot more based on just like some mental tweaks. So I don't know what your experience is on that, but... Not very much. I am very undisciplined. Well, that's kind of what I was getting at when I was asking you about uh, your like whether or not you, you when I was I was sort of pushing you on the idea that you can't improve or you can't do X or you can't do Y, like you can't learn X or Y in terms of uh, skills. And the, like the thing is, like, obviously, I don't know every single f- feature. I, I know en- enough about your personal life and your uh, personal limitations that you've uh, obviously you've explained enough about it on the podcast, but I've known you for longer than just the podcast has been running, obviously. So I know a little bit more about you than the average viewer will. And so like, based on that, obviously I have some data missing, probably a lot of data missing, I would say, but even like I, even despite all of that, all those caveats, I still think it's feasible for you to become more disciplined, to learn the sort of skill of disciplining and, and of being disciplined in general. And I, I almost wonder if it's like, again, like the mind defeating itself. I almost wonder if it's, um, not the same thing as like getting lost in thought or, or having a tyranny of thought where you're constantly thinking ahead of stuff in a, a, like a stressful situation, but it's more like you've come up with this worldview, this perspective, like you were just talking about where you, you view certain things as useful and certain things as not useful. And you wouldn't have come up with this perspective if it wasn't useful in and of itself. So there's obviously a reason for the perspective to be the way it is. And generally speaking, that means that the perspective that you developed served you well in your life. Like it's been true. Like whatever you've been thinking about, like it's rang true and it's been useful in some way, or it's just borne out as true based on the facts that of your life that you've experienced so far. And so what I'm getting at here is at some point, there's a point where that perspective ceases to be helpful for the purpose of developing new skills or the purpose of like whatever that, that example purpose may be. And so what I'm wondering is like, that's where I was talking about reevaluating and, and getting a new perspective in that sense and going for something like that. Like, obviously I'm not saying throw out everything because obviously some, a lot of that stuff is good. And, and we're in sync with a lot of ways, despite all of our differences in terms of where we like our environment and our mental landscape, like you were talking about earlier in the podcast. And so, like, I'm not suggesting that all of it needs to be thrown out or even most of it. Like, most of it's probably good. But I wonder if there's certain things that you could like take and, and put it, put onto one monitor in your me, in your brain and then open up the other on the other monitor, open up, like try to develop a different one, like re or reevaluate it, like copy and paste it into a new notepad plus plus document and start retooling it <laughs> or something like that. Like there's I'm wondering how far that could get you 
in ways where you, you like there's First always you things you got to figure out how to do that. Yeah, well there there's always <laughs> things that you feel you can't do. Like this goes for anybody. There's shit you feel like you can't do. And I think the thing that you're talking about with people who don't have the learning disabilities, people who just go in and, and they learn modeling or they learn coding, like iQuer fucking astounds me to this day because when I first found his work, when back in like uh, 2017 and 2018, when I was I released in Consummate, uh, in 2017, iQuer made two campaigns and I was watching the Jay Barino playthroughs. That really dates this fucking podcast. I was watching the Jay Barino playthroughs of, the, <laughs> uh, of his campaigns and all I could think of is like, these are so underdeveloped. They're missing so much. Like he's got some interesting ideas, I guess, but the, the, the execution is all off. There's like so much wrong. And then like his 2018 project, the Reaver Menace came out and I was like, there's so many fucking like weird ass micro missions and like wild, wild ass shit that also doesn't feel right. Like in a way, even though it was a bigger project and had more mod work and more interesting concepts and more like C++ programming put into it with the, with the plugins and stuff and presumably some like assembly perhaps as well. Like, obviously, more technical effort, and he had to be a, a smarter, better, more learned creator in some senses in order to make that. It felt like a regression in a sense because it still wasn't very consistent. And at no point during me watching his work did I ever think that this guy would surpass me in technical knowledge, not because I, I had like in my head boxed him out and said that there's no way he could do that. It's just like that wasn't a thought that his work would then lead me to believe. Like I would never have guessed that this guy is the same guy, like the same guy who made those work, those projects, those campaigns is also the same guy who would then go on to literally make every fucking project I've worked on since in consummate, even possible, let alone actually done. Like his work has been literally the cornerstone of my, my shit, like just his ability to get stuff done along with like some of the other programmers in the scene. But most it's mostly been him. He's been like the fucking programming workhorse of the of the community in general especially my work and so like that's the kind of person that i like my corollary to your t example of 3ds max and and learning modeling and then working on cgi and doing all this crazy shit is like he's working on shit that like is like it's better code than blizzard and that doesn't sound like a big feat but for me it is because i don't know what the fuck i'm doing with coding and i've tried to do it for pr probably more years than him or at the very least an equivalent number of years and like if we both started at the same time he soared ahead of me in the race if we were on a foot race and the foot race was about programming like he fucking won like he's already lapped me several times and i haven't even left the the starting area and so like that's my perspective on that but it's not because like like i i do know i can and probably will in my lifetime learn programming and learn how that shit works. It's, it's just got to the point. It has to get to the point where I discipline myself into actually doing it, like focusing on it and making it a, a making a point of actually doing it. And until that happens, it's not going to happen. That's pretty much the same thing with everything. But th that's sort of what I'm what I'm getting at is like the perspective that people without learning disabilities can just go and get stuff done and they will it into existence. Somehow they sit down and they get stuff done. Just sort of like the. Like the, the way that you described it made me think that like that must be in some ways like the same sort of thing that you talk about with me. Like you just will yourself up out of bed at 6 a.m. and start working. And like there's a sort of like a mystif mystification to it. Like I want to demystify that in the, in a sense because it feels like it's so alien and, and uh, unfamiliar to you that you, j you can't even like you're not – even able to like I was giving the example of Iqua and I at a race and you're still lost trying to get to the location where the race begins. You know what I mean? Like like that's what you're trying to find out is like, how did we even get to yeah. the point where we can start to think about that stuff? And like, that's the disconnect. And I wonder if a lot of that is, again, due to that perspective thing. It's like like you've already like you have already been doing this just in general, like uh, public speaking and or like on the video side of things and, and like podcasts and you've been doing all this content stuff like you were literally the inspiration for me to do let's playing in the first place let alone like starcraft content and stuff like obviously i learned a lot from your uh your old campaign creations bible and all of this other shit so like i've i've started out my relationship to you knowing like of you based on your work and then like reading some of the publicly available resources you had. And then there was like that one podcast that we did with Labyrinth before he banned me forever. And then <laughs> there was uh, some other shit that down the line and then I frauded you and then you blocked me and then eventually we got here. And so like, it's been a kind of a surreal experience just in that, like just as some guy who used to watch your videos and, and uh, you know, back when you had a YouTube channel. And then obviously I still watched a bunch of your let's plays on, from uh, off of game proc back in like, I think 2015 or something is when I rediscovered that. And like all, so all this shit basically is what I'm getting at is like, I never would have thought that you 
would have struggled with stuff to a harder degree than I did because at the time when I was just a dumb kid, I was like, I, I saw the quality that you were putting out and I saw like the, the kind of stuff you were talking about. And I, I wanted to not just imitate that, but I wanted to like f- distill what was good about that process and use it to fuel my own process. And that was like a, a big nut to crack in, in my case of trying to figure out like how to, how to do that. And I looked at the way that you were putting out Let's Play content and I was like, wow, I wish I could do like half of that. And so it's kind of funny to me that we're in like a role reversal now where I'm the one putting out all the content by comparison or like getting all the, the streams done, like all the work done and you're struggling to find the same way, same footing. And I guess that kind of speaks to what you're talking about with your skills regressing. You feel your skills have regressed. I just, again, I just wonder how much of that is like you need to find some perspective uh, that, that works better for you than what you currently have when it comes to actually getting down and doing the work. And I, I don't know what you, I've already blabbed around on for a while, so I don't know what you think about all this, but that's sort of like where, what it, where it, my train of thought led me to is, is going through all those examples and leaving you with that. Mm-hmm. So, well, like I said, it's, it's also part of the environment and the mental landscape that really facilitates this stuff working out or not. And, um, some people deal with it easier than others. Some people are more flexible than others. And, uh, like, I don't think I've met anybody who really struggles as much as I have with the, you know, the seemingly mundane things that I have. And, um, well, it should also be said that you're probably like, this doesn't age well. You have some, you, you have some external, like environmental stressors that, rival yeah. most people that i've ever known like in terms of this the amount of fucking insanity you have to deal with on a day-to-day basis it's pretty fucking high so it is worth acknowledging that but again it's like finding a way to it, it goes back to what i was talking about with like taking an example of a uh an excuse that is legitimate in your case just like when i was giving my example it's like i, I feel like there's a way to to triumph over that on top of it like Obviously, this could be mental landscape stuff. This could be like people deal with it differently. People are more flexible than others, like you were just describing and like you were just re- reminding me of as far as the that like concept. But at some point, I feel like you can get to a point where you like it's not that it doesn't affect you. It's that you it doesn't brick wall you. It doesn't stop you from doing at least a little bit of work, you know, like on a day to day basis or getting a little bit closer to whatever the completion is like what whatever the task is for that week or that day i mm-hmm. excuse me I, I wonder if there's like if there's a way to conceptualize it like when it's good you think about it as if you've got a task for that month like when it's really good you can conceive of well when it's super good when it's ideal you can operate in the time span of a year or more and when it's just okay, you can go from a week to a month or so of thinking ahead and like holding all of that in your head when it comes to planning and, uh, or not even really planning in an explicit sense, but just an understanding of what you're setting yourself up for as far as your own expectations for your own work. And when it's bad, it can only be like that day or that hour or that minute, like you were just describing with like your set of time, like, this is what I can do until I have to go feed the cat her drugs uh, in a couple hours or six hours or however long it was. Like, like you've already kind of done that, but like that is kind of what you have to do. And you, you have to learn to operate in a, those spaces. And that is based on flexibility, but it's also like literally the time limit in this case is just your lifespan. And so you have so much time, even if it doesn't feel like it to, dedicate to learning how to operate in this space and whatever skills you get at the lower level where you're you're trying to figure out what you can do that very minute to get work done or that very hour to get work done or however like low scale you have to be like however like moment to moment you have to live your life when it finally does get better uh and when, when your situation does improve when your environment improves it becomes more more um easier for you to dedicate time to work you'll be so steeled by the shit that you did have to go through you'll turn that into a positive in a sense and and that'll be like the thing that really restores your ability to control your life and and feel like you have some agency at all it's like you'll be able to say now that shit is actually good or at least better than it was 
now that shit's subsided, like I can look at my the fact that my, my track record was not marred by this. Like, yes, obviously productivity is Im- impacted, but I was still able to get my shit done despite all of the stressors. And like that's what I was able to do given the situation. Now imagine how much I can do now that it's a little bit better or a lot of it better or however much better it is. And and being able to use that as like a strength, even though in your mind it beats you down, it, it stops you from being able to sleep as well as you could, especially when that was like already a, an issue. It stops you from being able to feel like physically as, as good as you can be. It stops you from being able to focus as much as you can be or be disciplined with your thought as much as you can be. But like there's something about grinding through that despite every fucking thing that breaks you down and beats you down it's there's something about that about that process that makes it so that when shit finally breaks when the storm breaks and you're able to like take a breath and really recalibrate and not have to worry about everything for once in in like a a solid month or or year or however long it's been for you that is the kind of perspective that you get from doing that over and over again is like holy shit I can make use of this time way more because like I've gone through all this shit, all this bullshit that I had to go through. And, and so you like, you have more time than you think and you have to make use of all the time you think you can. It's like some combination of those two thoughts that I think got can, that's what I've relied upon during times of real shit. And that's what I think. I think those are universal, even if, not everybody can get the same mileage out of those thoughts. I think those thoughts are universally helpful. And I don't, I don't know what you think of that, but that's sort of where this leads me. I think I'm going to need a super long time to detox out of this stuff. Cause usually when this stuff happens, there's like this long lag period where I just don't want to do anything. I just want to rest. So. Well, that would make sense. What will happen? Yeah. I mean, that's sort of the same thing, though, is like just because I'm I'm saying like, uh, what can I do in this minute or what can I do in this hour or what can I do in this time block? That doesn't necessarily mean like, what can you do to be productive? Like sometimes it's what can I do to make sure that I can not be a stressed out fucking lunatic all day? Uh, you know, what, what can I do that's going to be helpful for me? Like it doesn't feel like you're getting work done, but in a sense, you are you're working on your on yourself. Like you're you're making it so that you have enough time to rest and. There's something about like, obviously, there, there's something to be said for not uh, letting yourself just do nothing for a long period of time. But there's also something to be said for finding out when you need to do nothing, like knowing and recognizing when you need to do nothing, when it's a need as opposed to a want, when there is when it's not like an excuse, but an actual need. And w- when it's like the best thing you can do in order to make use of the time, like leisure time is fucking important and personal time is important. Like being able to try and reset like that, that can be how you reset in many ways in alongside this, uh, this sort of mental meditation shit. And so, uh, yeah, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things. that's really hard to like describe, but when you run into it, it can be some of the worst shit, especially when you're already struggling. Like everything that's been going on, like you, like at this stage today, like I feel so fucking tired. I just don't want to do anything. Like I get home and it's just like, I want to sleep, but I can't sleep because I'm not like physically tired. I'm just like mentally exhausted. And, right. But at the same time, if you let yourself go to that, it can be really hard to get out of it to do stuff again. So. Yeah. You, you know, almost have to somewhat like. Consistent. It's y- important. Right. You have to find something that is it's like uh there's things you could do and would do that you need to figure out and do you like there's stuff that no matter how fucked up you feel there's shit like that's within reach it's sort of like just verifying a video or something like f- finding something that uh because a lot of this stuff is also like just how you feel about yourself at the end of the day too it's like there's a certain amount of uh like personal a vendetta you have with your your lazier or inactive less active self like that that there's something about that that is like that, that can be destructive if you let yourself fall into that kind of tyranny of thought too like i didn't get enough done today or i should have gotten more done today and, and there's like that's something i mentioned towards the beginning of this podcast that there's ways to use that to your benefit and there's ways to use that to your detriment it's like a a tool yeah. like any other and you can accomplish positive and negative things 
Yeah, that's why I try to use the overarching perspective because, you know, at least in my case, all the work has to be done eventually. At least as long as something is done, it's still a step forward towards the goal. So, right. Yeah. So, I mean, even if that goal is ultimately just to say that you got work done that day or that hour or whatever, that can still be in and of itself a, uh, yeah. Uh, a worthy thing to to work towards that uh, you can see progress in when you s- crawl into bed at the end of the day, or crawl onto the floor. In my case, well, sleeping on the floor is more comfortable than sleeping on the bed. Try that one on for size. I've actually heard that when you have back problems, it's sometimes best to sleep on your back. Uh, like it's supposed to be a temporary thing not a permanent fixture but yeah. <laughs> apparently it's it helps i don't know if that helps in your case mm, actually sleeping on my back is makes it worse sleeping on my side helps a little bit yeah well sleeping I on your side sleep is better on my for back on the sleep floor anyway. for about half a year i would not recommend it yeah it uh it fucked me up that in the chair fucked me up but eh, when you're depressed you can't even be bothered to go upstairs it happens well this podcast happened i'll tell you what is there a Did sort it? of a final thoughts or something, wrap up thoughts? We don't have to go immediately, but whatever you might be thinking about. Um, since it's the year 2020, every single month technically has a 420 day in it. Oh, that is a a, a very motivational thought to think of. Mm-hmm. Smoke weed. <laughs> Smoke weed, guys. Smoke weed. <laughs>